Good morning again. My name is Juan Pablo Guerrero. This is formally the start, the beginning of the General Stewards Meeting. We are very pleased that you were able to join us to put together, to build up the agenda with us, uh, to make uh, out of this meeting your meeting. Uh, I thank you very much for your participation, for your presence. For some of you, this is awful late. For some of you, this is really early, 6 a.m., now 10 minutes after 6. So I uh, appreciate very much your time. Uh, we are 53 members today, and we are so proud of um, such a milestone uh, since uh, all of you are champions in this agenda. And uh, uh, advancing fiscal transparency and public participation and accountability uh, has proven to be very important throughout time, but now more with uh, the conditions on which we are and in which citizen engagement, transparency, informed participation and accountability are crucial to be able to address the emergency due to the pandemic. Let me uh, thank very much the uh, gift uh, coordination team, um, Lorena, Albertina, two new members, Raquel and Elena, uh, because they have been working very hard uh, for this meeting. Let me also thank uh, IBP, our host uh, institution and the lead stewards, and the other lead stewards, the World Bank, the IMF, IFAC, the governments of Mexico, the Philippines and Brazil, because they have been also supporting us very much to put together this meeting. The objectives of the meeting uh, 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 are to uh, give an opportunity to get a current update uh, on our partners and stewards progress in their plans and actions in advancing our topics, fiscal transparency and public participation. Particularly, the main objectives of the meeting for this week are to share plans of actions of individual organizations as well as actions for the network, and we have many of them, many initiatives put together different stewards for a common objectives, and we're very happy this is happening more and more in our network. The second objective is, of course, to get updates on the latest fiscal transparency and participation initiatives being undertaken, including those advanced to address the challenges related to the COVID-19 fiscal package responses. We also are looking to having the possibility of strengthening the collaboration and cohesion among the members of the network and of course this is an opportunity to promote more cooperation and information sharing between all stakeholders and assist in peer learning and consequently capacity building among us uh, we have many topics in the agenda uh, this is a, a weak set of, of meetings um, let me just point out at the main topic that we will be addressing. Today, a very important uh, first meeting is to have the presentations of new commitments uh, by the recently admitted new members to the network. Uh, we have six new members and we're very pleased that they are all here in this meeting and they will be presenting their commitments and plans of actions, which is one of the conditions to be part of the network uh, not only to join and benefit from exchange and peer learning but to commit to share your experience and to commit uh, to uh, um, establish your goals uh, in order to be accountable before uh, the rest of the members of the network we will also speak um, later today uh, about trends in digital fiscal transparency lessons from successes but also the lessons that we get from disappointments, what we've been calling failing forward, 
um, and we had an issue translating that into Spanish and uh, French, but we sort of managed in Spanish, caer parado. Uh, measuring and evaluating improvements in fiscal transparency is another important meeting uh, that we will be addressing tomorrow uh, with uh, uh, the very important participation of uh, the IMF colleagues and the uh, IBP colleagues. And we have a couple of governments that will be uh, making us very happy about their incredible achievements in, in, in uh, fiscal transparency improvements. We'll have a session on open response and open recovery. This is a very important session that will be um, facilitated and has been organized by our OGP, Open Government Partnership colleagues. Uh, and we'll have a, a very high level meeting uh, for them to speak about the way in which, again, civil society and governments have been collaborating to address in their countries the challenges of the pandemic. We will also have a chance to speak about public participation. As many of you know, we have our Fiscal Openness Accelerator project. This is a wonderful project that has been supported by the US State Department and the World Bank Multi-Donor Fund, OGP, uh, among others. And uh, we have uh, five countries working very hard on uh, uh, their mechanisms for public participation and Chile will be joining us and other experiences such as Sierra Leone and the World Bank study on public participation in that session. Uh, then uh, we will have a very nice uh, session on a, a work that has been, a, 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 I would say, a, a outstanding a significant uh, product of the network. And this is a guide for data and data fields on uh, recovery, uh, emergency recovery, and on uh, the COVID-19 responses. Uh, led by uh, our dear colleague, Lorena Rivero, we have put together with your very strong engagement, a guide that helps governments and civil society to address the challenge of fiscal transparency uh, while uh, addressing, of course, the emergency of the pandemic. Uh, we will also have some countries uh, sharing their experience since they have been using this very important guide. We'll have a, 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 topic, a, a session on tax reform that will be hosted by ASIG, uh, our colleagues from Argentina, uh, another one on modernizing financial management information systems, where CAVI is hosting uh, the meeting. Uh, another one uh, on uh, innovative uses of uh, fiscal transparency and data for a gender perspective. And finally, uh, we'll have a training, a workshop session on open data from zero to hero. That's how Lorena. I wanted me to refer to that uh, session. This will be in the middle of the night for some of us, 1 a.m. In, in Washington, D.C., but it will be at a very convenient time for some of you uh, in Europe or mainly in Asia. Um, so, altogether, we have uh, something like 13, 14 sessions to share experiences and discuss on. Uh, um, uh, matters that are at the center of what we do uh, constantly every day. And we will also have a social gathering. Uh, we ask you to choose a nice background. I'm sorry, mine is not that nice today, but this is a, a painting that I, I got from my father. That's why I like it so much. There you see. And gives me also good luck. And it matches with my shirt, by the way. But we would like you to put together a background that is innovative and that refers uh, to your country in a way that makes it uh, very attractive and uh, uh, invites us to come visit you. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll be looking at your backgrounds. And uh, in that social session, we expect to give a prize to the most innovative and beautiful 
uh, background. So that's one part. And a little bit more crazy, we are also asking you to record a vid video of yourself uh, doing something that is not working and not in front of the computer, but maybe dancing, singing, uh, playing an instrument, cooking, or taking out your dog, uh, or playing with your cat, or telling us a joke. Uh, be innovative, be uh, free to relax and come to that session so we, we can also have a very nice relaxing opportunity to, to, to chat. Let me now ask um, Albertina to quickly go through the rules for the Platmore engagement. Uh, many of them have been uh, probably already uh, violated by me because I had to connect by, by my phone, but Albertina will make the point on good tips to make sure that our communications are useful and, and fluid. And, and then uh, I, I will introduce Lorena, who will tell us about um, uh, the dashboard that we have uh, to exchange, to communicate, to share our plans and uh, actions. So please, first, Albertina, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to have you here today. Um, just a, a short list of points that are important for um, our online format. Uh, the first one is please use your headphones. Uh, this will improve uh, your, the quality of the sound in, on the meeting from your side and from the, from, to all the participants. Um, try to, to have your microphone mute when you are not speaker, speaking. I see that everybody now is on mute, so very good. <laughs> um, you can have your video on unless you are experiencing some connection issues. Uh, to, to turn off the video and the, and the mic, you have these comments that you are seeing in the screen now. Uh, then we, ha we, we, we have three languages available for interpretation. So you can select in, your, in the menu English, French or Spanish. Those are the three languages that are available for, for you to hear. Um, we highly recommend when you select the language to also uh, click the option mute original audio. So this will block the original audio when you are listening and it will be more clear. Uh, when you're speaking, please uh, speak slowly and clearly so it's easier uh, for the interpreters. Um, and also you can use the chat for questions. Um, so that's all for now. And if you have questions, please just let us know and we'll here to help you. Thank you. Gracias, Albertina. So one of the advantages that we have with um, having meetings uh, uh, online is that um, Albertina, who has been always working very, very hard uh, to uh, ensure that everyone gets to where we're supposed to meet. We have an hotel, we have a venue, so on and forth, and so forth. But she hardly ever comes, but now she's part of the meeting, and we're very pleased that uh, you've been helping us so hard, and this is going so well. Gracias again. Now, Lorena uh, will uh, uh, speak about, um, again, the Encounter Dashboard, these systems that we have for us to share what we do and to put some pressure and, and interest uh, between us on what we do. Please, Lorena. Thank you, Juan Pablo, and thank you, everyone. I'm very glad to see you finally in, in the same meeting because it's been a while since we all meet. Um, I hope you're all doing well and your families are safe and healthy. So, Today, as, as you know, I sent you a couple of weeks ago a survey on your interests, on uh, what you're working on and what should we have in the agenda this time. And this was because, as you know, our most important thing is to have peer learning that is useful, not for what's on the past, but what you're actually interested on every time and what you're working on. So, as most of you know, and I, I, 
would expect that all of you know, we have this tool that's called the Encounter Dashboard. This Encounter Dashboard is where, uh, it's the tool that we use to enable communication and collaboration between the different stewards. The ones who do not know this, this uh, tool, uh, I'll leave you my email in the end, but um, the Encounter Dashboard is something that we started last year and we asked all our stewards to send us your plans, gifts to gifts, gifts to gift, and any um, requests that you might have from the network. Let's say that you want to learn something from, um, from Chile and you're from civil society of Mongolia. Let's see that you want to learn from, um, from the uh, gender budgeting of Argentina and you're from South Africa. So, this allows us to, to know what your interests are, what you're working on, but not only to us coordination team, but also among the different uh, stewards. Uh, so this tool, as you can see, is very important for the interaction of the network. Here we have been able to find what you are working on and the ones that are updating it more regularly, we are able to know what actually is going on. It actually made it easier for us. If you were not invited to present in one session and you had an incredible experience regarding some topic, let's say gender, maybe it's because we don't know about that because it's not here. So please be sure to, to um, keep us updated on what's going on. Um, some highlights of actions that we saw on 2019 or 2020 is uh, we saw new cross-cutting budgets on gender and childhood in Argentina um, and great publication of the open data of these uh, cross-cutting budgets and also a new cross-cutting budget in Colombia. Uh, it was a very big year for open data. That's very good news. We had new pu publishers of budget and spending data with South Africa, Croatia, Uruguay, Dominican Republic, and Argentina. Um, Costa Rica, I have it here with, with a mark because you were not stewards yet, you were partners, but you have been partnered since March last year. So I included it here. Um, and these were all part of the actions that were committed in this encounter dashboard. So we followed up we supported the publication and we're very happy to see that this publication has been done and with great consistency and great quality. So let's keep that up. Um, we saw great increases in the open budget index scores. Uh, many of the countries here had it as part of their actions in the encounter dashboard. So we had increases in all these countries uh, in um, some it's one, two points, but in some others it's 14 points. So it was a great um, increase in OBI scores. Um, we also saw budget literacy taking many forms from government, civil society, and coalitions between government and civil society. Some of these were directed to, a, to uh, students, let's say in elementary schools, but some of them were for even for civil servants that do not know how to understand the budget. So we saw many different actions on budget literacy. We have found that, an, uh, uh, that it, this is an important enabler of the use of the data. So budget literacy is uh, importantly paired with public participation and the use of the open data that is published. So that is one of the news that we see. Um, we have been working with the open contracting partnerships and we, and we now have this extension of the open contracting data standard that connects with the open fiscal data package. Please be sure to check it on GitHub, the ones who are already implementing open contracting and start linking data. That is, uh, that is great news. And we also saw an increased use of the open data for public participation with seven better budget data quests and three data on the streets rallies in these countries. Uh, so it was an active year. I could not include them all here, but I have some highlights and please be sure to keep it updated so we know which are they. Um, our trends in 2020, for the ones who have already said their uh, new actions. 
And with the ones that we see from our new stewards, we, have, we see an increase in actions related to the use of data um, for much more uh, specialized studies, such as the link between the budgets and the SDGs or the revenues, uh, very interesting studies going on. Actions related to the open budget survey, a lot more, which makes sense with the publication of the new open budget survey index in the past couple of months. So that's, uh, that's good news. We still see budget literacy emphasis at the top of the list in many of the cases. So we'll keep a focus on that. And we also uh, are glad to see that there are more actions related to public participation versus, uh, versus last year's uh, commitments. And finally, well, our, the actions of our new stewards are great places for collaboration. We already see some places for interaction, even between the new ones. And let's, uh, of course, with the older stewards as well. So that is uh, good news for the actions 2020. So next steps, please update your actions of 2020, 2021 for the ones who have not done so. If your organization does not have access or lost access because the person who had access left or something of the sort, please contact me. There's my email. And finally, please use it, share, interact, communicate. It's for that, it's for you. And we're very glad to have you here and keep this collaboration going. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, now starts uh, the presentation of um, uh, our stewards. And the way I, su I suggest that, that, that we go around the table is uh, first uh, by letting our lead stewards in three to five minutes to uh, give us updates on their actions. After that, we will invite uh, the um, uh, new members uh, the stewards that recently joined the network to do their presentation and after that we'll take a break, a five minute break, um, and then we will come back and continue going around the table. Uh, I will allow some of you to go first uh, because it's very late in your countries or because uh, you asked me to please go first giving other commitments. But again, we start with the list towards and, and let me see if um, uh, we have, I know she is around because I've seen her, Alta Prinslow from IFACT. She is in the middle of her vacation uh, and I promised that we will not take much of her very precious vacation time. Alta, please, Thank the you. floor is yours. Thank you so much, Juan Pablo, and um, congratulations to you and your team um, for an excellent program and really being sensitive to the needs of everybody when I look at the time, how you have scheduled it. I am going to share my screen um, with you today. I'd like to touch on three um, projects of IFAC. IFAC is the International Federation of Accountants. We provide support to the International Public Sector Accounting Standards Board and therefore we promote accrual accounting within the public sector and particularly accrual accounting in accordance with um, in accordance with international public sector accounting standards. So let me just check with Albertina. Can you see my screen? Yes, and you I'll see talk. the IFAC website, right? Yes. So I'm going to quickly go through the IFAC website to show you where you can find these tools. This is our landing page on the IFAC website. The first tool that I would like to share with you is the International Public Sector Financial Accountability Index. This is an index that IFAC does with SIPFA, and it looks at the accounting basis used in the countries, as well as the financial reporting standards being applied. 
If I go into this one just briefly, this is our 2018 publication. And please make a note that we are currently updating it for 2020 and would very much appreciate your assistance. I want to just share um, two pages in the publication with you. Here you can see the current financial reporting basis where we have 25% on accrual and we have the current financial reporting framework where we, we we are indicating the various frameworks being adopted with 5% directly IPSASPI. We also ask um, governments to tell us uh, what is going to happen in five years time. And I just want to bring to your attention the 65%, meaning that governments have told us that they will move 25% governments will go up to 65% governments in five years time at the time it was 2023 um, applying accrual accounting. Of course, we recognize that um, there are implications um, as a result of COVID. You could also find this really interesting information on our global impact map. Here you can select the index. You have an opportunity to look at the financial reporting basis um, or the framework. And um, for an easier um, reference, you also have a list here of the different countries. So that is easy to follow. That is our first tool I would like to share with you. The second tool is more important in the current environment. As everybody on this call today, we are extremely um, concerned about the long-term financial impact that the current um, COVID-19 interventions, interventions will have on public finance. And um, we recognize that in the current environment, the balance sheet is becoming far more important. So we have issued um, this new tool. Um, here you see the release note. It's also available in French and Russian. So what is this tool about? We have a specific page, the COVID-19 intervention assessment tool. Here is the publication. I'm going to go briefly through the tool, but also I want to create awareness um, about the fact that the tool can be applied irrespective of the gov government's basis of accrual. So it can be applied in a cash basis or a, ca a modified accrual basis. This second publication actually tells you then how could you start on this pathway to accrual. So let's look um, very briefly at the intervention assessment tool. We start off um, by explaining, of course, why it is important in the current environment. But what I really want to share with you is that we are providing an example. Um, we are providing an example of a government that is helping its national airline. It is going to give it one million um, of the money unit. It only has 40 million cash available. Therefore, it has to decide how it is going to generate the additional um, 60 million. And we are um, showing examples of a loan and of a transfer. In the first instance, we show the immediate cash impact. In the second instance, we say it's also important in making this decision as to what would be the right approach is to look at the longer term impact on the public finances. And here we look at the initial recognition in the, um, for an accrual impact. But we also say it's not initial, it's also what will happen at the end of the period as well as into the future. Lastly, in this step, and I realize I'm going fast, but this is really just introducing you to the tool. We bring it all together and show you why it is important to consider both the cash and the accrual method when you make decisions as it relates to government interventions um, in the COVID-19 environment. And then lastly, we emphasize the importance of starting your pathway to accrual, which brings you into that document that I have just shown you. But what is quite important is that this 
example that I have just shown you is only one example, but on this web page, you can actually complete a small form, which will immediately give you access to a X, an Excel spreadsheet. And on this Excel spreadsheet, you will be able to do exactly what I've shown you, determine the cash impact, the immediate accrual impact, end of period impact, future impact. And then it also here, instead of only looking at loans and transfers as per the example, here you have far um, more examples relevant to the current environment. Um, in this particular spreadsheet, we are showing the directional impact but you also have a spreadsheet that has a number example that you can use. And of course, you can complete this um, for your own government. So that is the second um, tool I wanted to share with you. So this is the COVID-19 intervention assessment tool. And please bear in mind to read it alongside the pathway to accrual um, document. The last tool I want to share with you is still in development. So this is more watch out for. We are going to work with SIPFA to develop more detailed guidance on a pathway to accrual accounting. So this would really be a very practical tool that will help you um, as it relates to the different um, matters to consider on your journey and it will enable you to develop a roadmap um, to accrual accounting. We are doing it in the context of the whole systems approach. So this particular tool will be the center, the accrual based information. But what we have come to realize is that for governments to really understand accrual based information, it is important to see how it fits within the wider public financial management machine. And so for this reason, with SIPFA, we will also populate other aspects of this PFM whole systems approach for your convenience. So Juan Pablo, it's quite Thank a you. mouthful, three tools. I'm going to put my email address in the chat. Please contact me if you need more information. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for taking again a part of your holiday to share this information with us. Thank you for sharing your email. People will be surely contacting you on some of the three tools that you kindly shared. Let me now go to Carolina Renteria from the International monetary fund. Carolina. Good morning, Juan Pablo. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good morning, Juan Pablo, Lorena, Albertina, and all colleagues in, in, the, in, the, in my screen. It is a pleasure to see so many people from so many places. Uh, and I really think this is a testament to the work that the that Juan Pablo Gift has been doing, the whole team, and also to the importance of the topic that we are dealing with. Uh, and I'm really glad that we have an opportunity to, to share our experiences with you. First, I would like to stress that for us, in the IMF fiscal transparency is critical to fiscal governance and accountability. It helps countries to achieve financial and economic stability, it fosters a well-informed debate about the design and results of fiscal policy and provides the public, including civil society organizations, to, that play a critical role in holding governments accountable with timely, relevant, accurate, and clear information about government spend. And also revenues. See, it's critical to mitigate misuse and corruption, and it also helps to strengthen the credibility of a country's fiscal plan thereby boosting financial markets and, fin and citizens' confidence. Finally, by highlighting risks to the fiscal position and fiscal outlook, fiscal transparency supports a timely and smooth fiscal policy response to changing economic conditions, thereby reducing the incidence and severity of crisis. And this has been particularly important during the current COVID-19 pandemic. In this context, it is not surprising it's a critical role in IMF surveillance, research, and program work, 
and our capacity development supports to member countries is strongly affected by this. If anything, COVID-19 has only served to increase the importance of fiscal transparency as countries respond to the crisis. Past crises have demonstrated in abundance the risk of corruption and misuse of funds where fiscal transparency is lacking. As you know, the Fiscal Transparency Code, which serves as the global standard for fiscal transparency, is a cornerstone of the IMS work on fiscal transparency. Since 2013, we have carried out 32 fiscal transparency evaluations based on the code, of, of which 28 have been published. This last year, we also carried the first two FTEs, fiscal transparency evaluation updates, which have been uh, published to Russia and Kenya. COVID-19 has had a massive impact on countries, economies, and the livelihoods of people. And the strategy has also significantly impacted our work at the fund. The IMF has promoted fiscal transparency and civil society engagement during COVID-19 in several ways. First, our MD has very clearly stated to, to the countries around the world that they should do all the fiscal policies that, is, that are needed, do what it takes, but keep the receipts. And keep the receipts is the important part of this in fiscal transparency. We have published since, the, since March, we started preparing and publishing notes on this, what is called a special series on COVID-19 notes, aimed at supporting member countries address 19 related challenges. Countries, countries have found these notes very important and they are all available in our webpage. They cover the range of topics that the IMF has done, but as part, as part of that, there are more than 30 uh, fiscal policy related notes and on then more than 10 are public financial management. Some of the notes that clearly address the issues that are gonna be discussed during this week is the note of keeping the receipts, transparency, accountability, and legitimacy in emergency response. A note on budgeting in crisis, guidance for preparing the 2021 budget. A note on enhancing digital solutions to implement emergency response. And a note on budget execution controls to mitigate corruption risks in pandemic spending. So all these notes are, are short, are specific, and our, 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 our interest is to help countries guide the way they are designing their policies and implementing them. We have also engaged remotely with member countries through webinars to discuss COVID-19 related challenges and facilitate peer-to-peer -peer exchange of experiences such as this one. One example of this was a series of three webinars in June and July on fiscal transparency organized jointly by us, the Fiscal Affairs Department, the IMS, IMF Middle East Technical Assistance Center, MITAC as we call it, and the Open Budget Partnership. The webinars had participation from more than 100 civil society representatives and focused on the Open Budget Survey, survey results for uh, the Middle Eastern countries and how to implement how to improve fiscal transparency practices. Another example I would like to highlight was a virtual community conference in July to promote effective use of COVID-19 finance in Africa, co-organized with the African Training Institute and targeted at African civil society organizations. The aim was to discuss the IMF support to help countries cope with the COVID-19 pandemic and listen to civil society organization suggestions of safeguards that should be attached to COVID-19 funding in key areas of transparency and accountability. Prominently in the financial support provided by the IMF to member countries during COVID-19. Such support has frequently been accompanied by transparency requirements in the use of funds, notably related to exposed audit and transparency in procurement. Demand has been picking up from countries that are requesting us in our capacity development to address issues that they are featuring, that they are right now facing. For example, we have worked a lot on, right now many, many countries are issuing, for example, guarantees, uh, guarantees to support, uh, support transfers and support to the private sector, but this is an area that countries were not used to working. 
So we have been called by many countries to support them design the safeguards and this all of this is just one example of how our capacity development not only is responding to member countries needs but it's also responding to the COVID-19 all in a medium term agenda and, and, and the other area in which we have been working a lot is we just launched a fiscal risk work program fiscal risk management becomes key now not only many fiscal risks are materializing and affecting the fiscal position of countries but many of the policies that have been implemented carry are embedded have a lot of fiscal risks as, as in them and it's very important that a framework is put in place to understand these risks to quantify them to make them transparent going forward we expect our work on fiscal transparency will be shaped by covid 19 to, in the future we will keep providing capacity development support to member countries through targeted on-demand support, regional webinars and fiscal transparency issues, and the publication example. This week we are going to publish a note that we wrote uh, co-authored co together with the World, World Health Organization, and it was reviewed by IBP on the design and management of COVID-19 extra budgetary funds as you know many countries have created parallel mechanisms not in the budget but in parallel and then we are we are also addressing this issue in this note we are also continuing with the fiscal transparency evaluations and now and we are fiscal risk work program that it's going to cover the tools we are designing tools and they are going to be public we are doing a, no, a lot of analytical work and we are doing a lot of uh, capacity element work uh, so we look forward to engaging with gift and other partners and member countries on agenda and we are keen to explore options for cooperation and coordination of joint efforts we are very happy for example to see in the agenda that georgia is going to be presenting. We have had a very fruitful relation with the with this government. Uh, they did a fiscal transparency evaluation a few years ago. They have really taken seriously the um, need to implement the recommendations of the fiscal transparency evaluation. We recently did a balance sheet mission in which what was just presented by Alta in relation to having a full picture of assets and liabilities was made. And it's a clear example of a country that is committed to, to improving fiscal transparency and improving, improving PFM. So with this, I would like to thank again and give everybody, wishing everybody is gonna be a very fruitful week. I'm sure it will be. And I'm looking forward to hearing from all the examples. You will hear from our other colleagues, from our teams that will be presenting during the week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolina. Um, again, a very broad agenda, but we are so pleased that um, collaboration is getting stronger and stronger with, with, with you, uh, our dear colleagues at the IMF. Uh, our friend from um, the World Bank, uh, the representative of um, the World Bank before GIFT, Robi Senderovich, had to leave uh, because the conflicting agenda, but, but he might be back later. Uh, let me ask now uh, the policy director of IBP, Vivek, to uh, take the floor after Vivek. So we are a little bit more aware of what's coming afterwards. Uh, I will ask uh, Rolando Toledo uh, from the Department of Budget and Management of the Philippines to come in uh, and uh, share his um, uh, actions. Uh, then uh, Victoria Rodriguez Ceja, uh, Vice Minister of Budget and Expenditure of Mexico. And then I'll ask uh, our friends from Indonesia since it's so late there. So that's uh, the order uh, that will follow for the next uh, four people taking uh, their uh, turns on sharing their experience. Vivek, your turn. Thank you, Juan Pablo, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's really um, 
great to be part of uh, this this discussion and if there's any silver lining from uh, the covid crisis it is that all of us are able to join virtual platforms and therefore be in a meeting in a way that uh, perhaps would be much more challenging had it been uh, a requirement to only meet in in person uh, the past several months have been uh, an extremely uh, challenging period for us at the International Par Budget Partnership and our uh, civil society partners and other partners uh, around the world, as can be expected given the, the gravity of the, the crisis and the situation that we are facing uh, worldwide, both in terms of the uh, health impacts as well as the economic uh, impacts of, of the COVID crisis. Uh, but I want to focus on some of the, uh, the, the positive stories also that are uh, emerging from the work that we and our partners have been undertaking over the past several months. Uh, Lorena mentioned the open budget index and the release of our uh, latest survey results. I'll come to that towards the end, but let me start by sharing um, some, some of the work that we have been doing through our SPARC program, which operates in seven countries in, in Africa and Asia, through which we connect local um, social movements, uh, broad-based uh, membership organizations that work at the community levels who are uh, engaging on service delivery issues with governments specifically around the public financial management issues that create uh, difficulties in local communities to access basic services from governments. The COVID crisis has led uh, to us modifying our program a bit, which has been in operation for more than for more than uh, two, two and a half years in, in these seven countries. And we have leaned into the COVID issues uh, and used some innovations to be able to continue our engagements with governments and to promote dialogue between uh, local communities and governments around the specific challenges that they are confronting. In Nigeria, as a result of the uh, shutdowns, it became very difficult for local civil society groups and for the public to, to move around the country. But journalists were given a pass. And as a result of that, what we did was to begin some partnerships with investigative journalists that allowed us to get access to uh, what was happening on the ground and, and report on those uh, back to, to government and, and others. In Indonesia, we've developed a application that allows for um, social audits to be undertaken uh, and participation from local communities to be done through um, virtual platforms. Uh, we have uh, not only been focusing on the accountability aspects in terms of the anti-corruption issues that perhaps a lot of organizations have rightly uh, given some uh, attention to. Uh, we've also been focusing on influencing government plans around their COVID packages and around the uh, rest of the, the budgets that are being formulated even as governments have been implementing uh, COVID specific uh, financial measures. Uh, in um, Senegal, for example, uh, through the, the SPARC program, we were able to um, get the government to agree to a special package for the disabled communities uh, who were otherwise being left out of the relief measures. And as a result of that, 50,000 families in, uh, in Senegal that are uh, led by or con consist of a dis person from uh, suffering from a disability now have access to a, a, f a financial and relief package from the, from the government. In South Africa, we have uh, connected uh, uh, the local communities that have facing challenges in water and sanitation services, which obviously have a key um, relationship to the spread of the, the COVID virus with uh, the government's planning around water and sanitation services and directing more funds towards those uh, services. In Nigeria, we worked with the small women's farmers organization even during the COVID crisis and uh, have managed to get some important improvements and uh, successes around some of their advocacy demands for agricultural inputs and services to be directed to small women farmers. Uh, 
A second program that we have been engaging on, uh, which has also received, I think, some attention during the COVID crisis is around the need for better audits to be undertaken and expedited audits to be undertaken by national audit officers, the supreme audit institutions. In five countries, we have worked uh, and are actually working with civil society organizations and supreme audit institutions around uh, tracking government follow-up on audit reports that have been issued in the past few years uh, on which the governments have not been taking remedial measures. So for example, in Sierra Leone, the National Audit Office issued a report on the poor water and sanitation services being made available in schools around the country that are having uh, especially bad impact on the abilities of girls to attend schools. Uh, and uh, we are trying to promote actions from the governments based on, on those audit recommendations. In Argentina, it is working on uh, the Chiagas disease, which is a Lyme disease and that impacts rural women especially, uh, and, and uh, trying to get the government to take necessary steps to to improve the implementation of that, of that program. In Nepal, it is around uh, local development programs and uh, uh, the corruption and mismanagement of uh, a massive government program that uh, uh, is um, been in operation for many years and which the National Audit Office's, uh, Office has pointed out has suffering from, from some uh, serious challenges and trying to get the government to improve uh, the, the guidelines through which that program is being managed. So, so those are some ways by which on uh, the audit side also we have been working. And finally on the open budget survey, uh, as Lorena mentioned, there have been some improvements that uh, we have uh, documented uh, since our last round. Um, but we still feel that there is much more that can and should be done by countries. And so we've launched a, a campaign to, um, uh, to solicit support from a network of stakeholders across a range of countries to get behind a set of targeted uh, asks that we have of governments to achieve sustained improvements in fiscal transparency over the next five years. And we've been in touch with many of you who are part of this discussion uh, individually to uh, be part of this campaign and, and uh, hope that more of you can can join this uh, this effort and i can share more information on the on the campaign with you uh, as a, in a follow up email so so let me stop there and thank you once again to the gift team for giving us this opportunity to to meet uh, in these challenging times thank you vivek uh, ibp is uh, our house uh, we are administratively based uh, at IBP and, and Vivek uh, was my neighbor and now I can only see uh, him uh, by video. I miss you, my dear friend. Uh, the other day we had a coffee on the distance uh, and I, I believe that Warren, the, the executive director of IBP is, is also around, so thank you. Uh, the lead stewards, include, um, as, as uh, you know, the institutions that just, pre that just presented, plus uh, the, the World Bank and three governments. Uh, the government of, of Brazil couldn't join us this time, but we do have the government of the Philippines representatives, the Department of Budget and Management, and uh, Secretaria de Hacienda of Mexico. Let me ask uh, uh, Rolando Toledo, Roli, from the Philippines to uh, take the floor. Yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know. Good evening to everyone uh, from the Philippines. And I know, and uh, uh, thank you for inviting us just to share our experience as far as a fiscal transparency in the Philippines. Okay. Uh, as a founding member of the Open Government Partnership and one of the lead stewards of the Global Initiative for fiscal transparency, we believe in the promise of fiscal transparency in fiscal policies. So opening up a uh, timely, uh, comprehensive uh, and relevant financial uh, management information to the public, uh, especially during the uh, pandemic, uh, ensures that citizens are able to make informed decisions as well as uh, collaborate and 
engage with government in enhancing public policies. Now, recognizing the importance of putting citizens first at the heart of any government undertaking, uh, the president then created the participatory governance cluster of the cabinet. Uh, through like uh, executive order number 27, series of 2017 uh, with this uh, new administration. So the PGC is basically tasked to enhance transparency and citizens engagement in governance. Now, the country also develops strategies to enhance fiscal transparency and citizen engagement under our Philippine Development Plan 2017 to 2022. Allow me to share with you our COVID-19 initiatives pursuant to our R Republic Act 11469, which promote transparency and citizens' participation. At the national level, we have continued to uphold budget transparency through proactive disclosure of the funds augmented and reallocated for priority programs, activities, and projects being implemented in response to the pandemic. Uh, the DBM or uh, issued uh, circular number uh, 2020-9, which compels national government agencies and departments to submit and post reports on the utilization of their uh, agency budgets for COVID-19 initiatives. Now, at the local level, uh, local government units are required to prepare and publicly disclose monthly reports on fund utilization and on the implementation status of programs, activities, and projects. Now, aside from upholding budget transparency at the local and national level, the executive branch also publishes and submit a weekly Bayanihan report to Congress, which contains updates on government initiatives being implemented to address the pandemic. We also have an official COVID-19 response website, which is COVID-19 gov.ph, which serves as one-stop shop for basic comprehensive information about COVID-19 pandemic and the initiatives of our national government to address its impact. Also, the government conducts daily press briefings in which the public can ask questions and seek clarifications directly from government officials regarding COVID-19 measures. Moreover, we have recently launched the Philippine Humanitarian Assistance Registry website for information on the distribution and utilization of humanitarian assistance to the intended beneficiaries. Uh, this was just launched last week. Now, aside from these COVID-19 initiatives, we also ensure fiscal transparency by regularly keeping up with the public publication of key national budget documents. We're also sustaining the implementation of our fiscal openness program, such as the uh, transparency seal, open data, full disclosure policy, seal of good local governance, and extractive industries transparency initiative. We also have the Freedom of Information program, where 11,162 out of 22,843 requests were completed or acted upon as of May 2020. There were also 25 focal, local, ladder, local FOI ordinances as of date. So our uh, 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 Philippine Commission, oh, our PCOO is very active on this. On another front, our participatory governance initiatives are also making waves at the international level. So we're happy to say, and we're happy to uh, inform you that out of 117 countries evaluated for the 2019 Open Budget Survey, the Philippines secured the top spot in Southeast Asia for budget transparency. This makes the Philippines the most fiscally transparent country in the region while ranking 10th place worldwide. Now, the Philippines is also the only country in the world where citizens, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I, we can claim this one. Uh, we have this, what we call the uh, citizens are part of the auditing team. This is being done through uh, the Citizens Participatory Audit Program of our Commission on Audit. Now, 
The government also puts premium on citizens' engagement as an integral part of the whole budget cycle to be able to build a greater public trust. Hence, we have participatory governance mechanism in place throughout the local and national budget process. This is through the formulation of budget priorities under the local development investment plan and regional development investment plan, which are formulated by government and non-government representatives. Now, moving forward, to enhance our fiscal transparency effort by number one, ensuring timely publication and comprehensive of the eight essential budget documents. That's why we have this uh, and uh, a high score in open budget survey. Also, number two, sustain public uh, publication of our people's budget service to, of course, empower citizens in institutionalizing our fiscal openness in the country. We will initiate outreach efforts and engagement with Congress and related openness fiscal openness measures and institutionalizing citizens' participation in the budget process. Moreover, part of our administrative agenda is to create an interagency task force on fiscal openness and to reestablish the CSO desk within the DBM. This is to ensure that the gov national government keeps its commitment in actively disclosing relevant fiscal data as well as implementing and sustaining effective fiscal transparency initiatives. We're also lobbying the passage of the Budget Modernization Bill and People's Participation in the Budget Process Bill in Congress, which are pivotal uh, to the institutionalizing policies on fiscal transparency and citizens' participation in the budget process. So, uh, in closing, it is clear that fiscal transparency is a prerequisite to effective citizen engagement. If greater fiscal openness is pursued, the outcome can only be a government budget that is responsive and targeted to the needs of our citizens. So I will end from this, uh, this uh, uh, Juan Pablo, and thank you thank and you. stay safe God, and God bless us all. Thank you very much. I really like it when uh, governments come to the table with a new or renewed uh, engagements such as you did Rolly and I also like it when when they say we're the only country doing this because <laughs> some countries say that's not possible we should also do it or some others say no we're also doing it so that's that's the idea of this type of dialogue let me now go to my very dear Mexico City uh, with uh, Victoria Rodriguez Ceja, Subsecretaria de Egresos, Secretaria de Hacienda. The floor is yours. Hola, Juan Pablo. Eh, Hello, Juan Pablo. It's a pleasure to greet all of you. Unfortunately, the Undersecretary of Hacienda was not able to be here with me today, so they asked me to be part of this team of, because I am part of the transparency team in Mexico, and so I'm going to be participating here and to tell you about Mexico's commitment to fiscal transparency, the progress that we've been able to make and of course the plans that we have for the future which are several so could i share a screen here i'd like to try yes Can you see the screen? No. I think it's still loading. 
Yes. Mouth. Yes. There it is. Okay. One of the first topics that we've really taken seriously, as you can see, is the way of making our content more user friendly on the fiscal transparency site. And we want people to be interested in it because we realize that when people perceive that this is an initiative for citizens and of government accountability and citizen empowerment, we always have a better response from uh, the civil society networks. As you know, like in the Philippines, we are a steward member and we've been working on these issues of open budget and fiscal transparency for a long time. In 2011, we began to produce different and innovative materials with an inclusive perspective. Throughout the years, we've been able to open up, uh, up an, a good amount of information in open format. One of the biggest challenges is to get more and more information out to the public and as Lorena mentioned, to do a little bit of budget literacy work because Mexico is a country that is very heterogeneous in terms of educational levels and economic uh, classes. And so we want to make sure these uh, tools to go out to citizens who might not be able to get them in other ways. So we are framing our work within a process of getting budget information out in a more inclusive way. One of the biggest tools that we've used is the translation of our materials to the main indigenous language in Mexico, the Nahuatl. Uh, almost a million people speak it. And that's a way to help get out more information to that group of people that has ne never had that kind of information before. And we've had a good response in terms of visits to the page. And we started that in the current budget year and we plan to do it again. And we are also trying to include more uh, information who might have uh, different disabilities, uh, visual disabilities, for example. And so in this sense, we are trying to reinforce the training that we do and to expand it to different types of the pub audiences. Here, and we have a massive online course on fiscal transparency that we hope to expand next year. This year, because of the pandemic, we weren't able to do it, but we plan to do it for next year. This year, we were able to do the fifth edition of the data rally. And one of the editions that we had more participation was this year and 190 uh, works were requested. And this is a big, challenge uh, to make sure that we can help other governments who don't have the same level of transparency that Mexico does. And we want to improve the relationship between the federal government and local governments. And so we've been really working on that since last year. And since it's a very complicated work because of autonomy that local governments have. We hope that we'll make more progress next year, adding uh, more and more local governments and national governments to this initiative. Also, we are expanding our audience base so that the information will get out to everyone. And there's a specific training for university students on these issues because we're trying to democratize the information and have the students really use the information and also have them help us with the analyses that they do. 
and so that we can have joint implementation between government, civil society, and academia. In this sense, one of the best tools uh, has been communication through social networks through uh, an initiative called El Dato Mere Respalda. And through social networks, especially the ones that we consider enriching social networks in 2019, we just had 1,500 uh, people respond participating in this tool. But this year we have more than 3,000 and we've been doing that uh, within the context of the training on open data. This has been one of the most successful trainings. We had more than 17, we had 17 countries participating and a total of 4,615 people accredited, 53% women, 47% men. We're very happy about that. We had a high level of participation of government representatives, but also academia and students. And so the first edition of this course reached uh, there were about 62% of the participants last year and 65% of participants this year that were able to finish the course. We are improving the course now. And that whole effort, as our friends from the Philippines said also, has allowed us to have an increase in our score on the open budget survey for 2019. Mexico was in the fourth place in the world, just behind New Zealand, South Africa, and Switzerland. And so, oh, not Switzerland, Sweden, sorry. <laughs> A couple of more minutes. Yes, very quickly. One of the things that we learned by responding Responding to this survey is that one of the problems we've had in Mexico or that one of the shortcomings and also an area of opportunity is precisely the area of citizen participation. And so that's why our work is targeted in such a way that we can have more uh, participation mechanisms. And you'll see that reflected in the open budget index in this. These are our future plans. As I told you, we're trying to reach more people and we're ha using more inclusive tools. And we have government support for this. And we've been making innovative use of open data. And we're trying to make use of all of the support that the government is giving now, not just in the context of the pandemic, but all of the different support that the current government is providing to civil society and certain vulnerable groups. And we want to include there all the information about beneficiaries and the amount of budgetary transfers that are being made to certain groups. So very quickly, as I said, these are our plans for the future. And if you have any questions, we can certainly answer them later on. Here are the links to our results and new initiatives. Uh, hello, Joan. Hello, Joan. This is Echo. Yeah, uh, first of all, I would like to extend the word from Mr. Kunta, unfortunately, uh, he has a conflicting uh, agenda tonight. So uh, I will speak on behalf of him uh, in this conference. Is that okay uh, with you, Joan? Yes. Uh, so good morning, uh, everyone, uh, colleagues. Uh, and good evening so, to some of you, especially uh, our colleagues from Philippines. 
uh, first of all, uh, is it okay? Uh, I'm allowed to share the presentation here. Okay. Okay. Can you see our presentation? Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, first of all. Uh, uh, on behalf of Minister of Finance of Indonesia, I would like to extend our appreciation uh, to give team, I did give team, to arrange uh, this wonderful program. And also for your continual support uh, for Indonesia to strengthen uh, our uh, quality of public uh, transparency in Indonesia. Uh, our continuous cooperation uh, have resulted in in an increased rank of Indonesia in the latest uh, result, uh, OBS 2019, uh, we improved our, our score uh, to 70. Uh, and in Southeast Asia, uh, still below our college from Philippines, uh, but we are trying our best. Uh, one day we can catch uh, the quality of transparency in our neighbor country, uh, Philippines. Uh, in this short moment, uh, I would like to share with all of you uh, our effort uh, this year in, in Indonesia, especially uh, what uh, Ministry of Finance of Indonesia are trying to do to increase or to enhance the quality of our uh, fiscal transparency. Uh, first of all, it's about, uh, is on public availability of document, uh, especially budget document. Uh, Based on OBS survey 20, uh, 2019, uh, Indonesia is similar to Philippines, uh, is always on time in, in, in uh, publishing uh, our, our uh, financial note or bill or advertorial uh, to public. Uh, for example, uh, once our president uh, complete uh, his uh, speech in parliament uh, regarding uh, budget proposal, our team, uh, we'll directly upload it uh, and publish it in our government website. Uh, for another example is uh, perhaps after our Ministry of Finance, uh, Sri Mulyani, uh, uh, finished uh, her, her presentation or speech in, in, in Parliament regarding uh, perhaps a, a semester report or, uh, or other budget-related document. Our team also uh, directly on the same day uh, publish uh, those all documents uh, to public so public can access it and also monitor it. Uh, and in this year, particularly in a proposed budget of 2021, uh, to, uh, 2021 that we just submitted uh, exactly 10, 10 days ago to the parliament, uh, we managed to also publish uh, the advertorial uh, in uh, English language. Uh, normally, we only uh, publish on the uh, our uh, Indonesia language, and this year we try to manage uh, so that not only Indonesian citizen can access uh, and get information about our proposed budget of 2021, but also international uh, citizen. This is quite a milestone in in, in our country because normally uh, it took uh, it takes four to six weeks uh, for us or on our team to publish a uh, budget document uh, in English language. So uh, it's quite, uh, again, it's quite a milestone uh, for, for uh, Ministry of Finance and in, uh, of Indonesia. Uh, and then this year, uh, we also trying to increase the public participation uh, by developing a budget e-book. We call it uh, BEB. Uh, we are still uh, developing this application. It's still on, on prototype. Uh, this is going to be a, a mobile app, a mobile application. Uh, as perhaps uh, Juan or team from GIF and IPP uh, once ac uh, have access our uh, data portal website of Indonesia budget. We have uh, budget, uh, budget, national budget information, and then budget realization, and also we have. A budget map, uh, but uh, for this uh, this time being, all of this information uh, is published through a website. Uh, through a website, so for this year, we are trying uh, to expand that by by developing 
uh, a mobile app, a mobile app uh, so that uh, everyone can download it. Uh, perhaps we, we can create also the offline uh, budget app so without internet, even without the, the internet connection, people can still see uh, the, the Indonesian budget. Uh, this uh, mobile app, uh, mobile application, uh, hopefully can be launched uh, in the end of the year. Hopefully, uh, we are very hopeful. And after we launch, uh, all of uh, citizen can download the application through uh, Apple uh, App Store or perhaps uh, Google Google uh, Play Store. And also. Uh, Ministry of Finance of Indonesia also working with the bank, uh, the World Bank, in developing another, uh, I cannot call it, this is another mobile app, but a mobile app that focuses specifically on the infrastructure uh, expenditure. So this will be uh, provide, uh, this will provide, uh, this application will provide uh, the detailed data of every province uh, regarding the exp uh, exp infrastructure expenditure on those province, on those district. Uh, Ministry of Finance is still working on that and uh, this application uh, is led by Mr. Kunta. Uh, regarding budget and COVID uh, in Indonesia, uh, as uh, we are aware uh, that every country uh, has already allocated so much money uh, to to overcome uh, this pandemic, uh, as well as Indonesia. Uh, Ministry of Finance is still trying to is still developing the website uh, that will publish the the, uh, the publish the update data of the execution uh, or uh, the realization of uh, budget allocated for COVID. In Indonesia, we call it a National Economic Recovery Program. It consists of not only for health expenditure, but also uh, for a small ex uh, enterprise uh, assistance and also social safety net and other, uh, other aspects uh, impacted by the COVID-19. Uh, for, for the time being, uh, until perhaps uh, next month or in two months, we we can finally provide uh, the, the website for, for the citizen. For the time being, Ministry of Finance uh, arrange a monthly uh, press conference uh, led by our minister to inform people uh, regarding the realization of budget, including uh, the realization of uh, budget for COVID. So every month, uh, normally the second weeks of, uh, of the month, Ministry of Finance will have a uh, press conference uh, to media and also all of uh, the citizens can access that through YouTube uh, to provide information on on the the, the update the update of our our budget especially for COVID uh, and to close my uh, my presentation my short presentation because I think Mr. Juan only uh, allow three to five minutes I think. I still have another uh, 30 seconds. Uh, again, I would like to, to express uh, my, my gratitude, my appreciation on behalf of Ministry of Finance uh, for our cooperation uh, with, uh, with uh, IBP and GIF. Uh, because we believe uh, the transparency is not uh, only uh, budget transparency it's a collective effort it's not only uh, depend on uh, on one country so this program is we really, uh, we looking forward to learn a lot from this program uh, I forgot to say that uh, um, for this year uh, perhaps some of you familiar with with uh, another phase of, uh, of transparency in Indonesia Last year we have Mr. Krishna and Mr. Wawan who, who lead the transparency and this year we have a new team. I forgot to introduce to all of you. Uh, we have, uh, perhaps if you can see the participant list, you can see uh, Erawati. Uh, she is the leader of uh, transparency in DG Budget. And then uh, myself, Eko Kurniawan, and also we have two uh, new member, uh, Kanda, and Kiki, uh, four of us, uh, all of us are from DG Budget of Indonesia. Uh, I think uh, that we all from from Ministry of Finance, uh, Ministry of Finance of Indonesia. Thank you, uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, further discussion.
first and then you be first, Carmela. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have six. Uh, uh, we have six magnificent new uh, of finance uh, and for uh, civil society organizations that have worked very strongly on uh, fiscal transparency and participation in their countries. Let me ask. Ask um, Eric Robos from the General Director of Costa Rica. It's early in the morning in, in, in San Jose. Are you there, Eric? Sí, buenas tardes. Buenos días, Juan Pablo. <laughs> yes, yes, good morning. Yes, we had to get up really early. But here I am. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> On behalf of the Ministry of Finance in Costa Rica, we're here, uh, two of us, Carlos Aguirres and myself. We have been working on this issue. We've become part of the network. Our first uh, presentation today is about to be shared on the screen. So I would like to begin by talking about what we have done in Costa Rica. We are joining our first stewards meeting. Initially, in the survey, we received quite a low score yeah. in terms of citizen participation. So we focused on this in order to improve. We wanted citizens to participate. The budget is very complex because budget issues are complex. Therefore, we focused on a project through which we could basically reach more citizens and educate them about the budget, make sure that they get involved and they manage to understand the different issues within the budget and also um, understand how citizens read such uh, budget. We developed, like I said, this project with our partner from the Costa Rica University. We started working in February 2020 and we opened a, an open budget school, which is about budget education. As you can see, then we were all stricken by the um, pandemic and we had to start having our classes virtually. That was also a little complicated. We had to change the schedule. Uh, we had to coordinate with many people. We had Lorena, Maria, uh, Maria Jose from IBP. Uh, we had also civil society organizations that participated. We actually had very positive results. So we hope to continue with this project. Another action that we developed what had to do with the publication of, datas about, uh, of data about the national budget under the OFDP. We've started publishing data on Costa Rica. Another project that we hope to implement at the end of this year, although we might see a little bit of a delay uh, because of the pandemic, in fact we are seeing such delay, is a portal about fiscal transparency. Sometimes people don't find what they're looking for. So we developed a tool to simplify the process. These are some tests of the portal before it goes live. You can choose the institution and hopefully find the information of the different budget items, the execution, of each one of them. You can choose also a year range for here. For example, you can see from 2010 to 2020. Those are the actions that we have developed. We wanted also to present our action plan today. We've identified three main actions. To promote action to improve our score in the open budget survey we basically 
focused mainly on developing certain documents like the mid-year review. According to the survey, we, do, we didn't have such documents. We have similar documents, but they don't meet the requirements established by the survey. Therefore, we are working on adjusting the content so that in future surveys, we can, they can be considered and we can get better scores. We also publish a citizen's budget, but it has to be improved. So based on the feedback that we received through the survey, we need to improve this um, budget. And that's what we're working on. We are trying to adjust the, doc the content of certain documents and also improve the citizen's budget. We also developed a program on budget literacy and in, under this item we will continue to work on this open budget school both um, in person as well as virtually and we are also working on making it fully virtual given this new trend we had to we had to this way we will also be able to reach more people we will work on disseminating and promoting budget data through the platform known as open spending. What we are trying to do first is get in contact with uh, universities and identify different degrees that have to do with public finance so that students can use such data for their analysis and interpretation of the data. We also, in Costa Rica, we also hope to, together with the open budget a partnership. We hope to have a very active participation in the open data uh, forum. And another item is to exchange experiences and lessons learned with all the other stewards of the network. We're interested in the issue of promoting citizens to get involved in the accountability process. Like I said, we had a very low score in terms of citizens' participation. And we thought that a good way of encouraging citizens to participate was for, to have them involved in requesting accountability by the government. Since we are beginners in this sense, we would also like to know a little bit about what other countries have, do, have done in this regard so we can learn from it. In terms of the, of the main partnerships that we have established, at the beginning we were by ourselves in the Ministry of Finance and now we have many friends. We have Innovap, it's, our collaboration has been truly incredible. They've been very helpful. IBP, GIFT, the PEN, Programa Estado en la Nación, and like I said, also the Open Government Partnership. We're work, working there through that partnership on open data and transparency. And we've also established some contact with the OGP. So like I said, our very small network has increased, has grown, and we hope to continue to grow it. This is our presentation. I will now happily entertain any questions, if there are any. of uh, transparency and participation. So it was very nice to see it appear because that's exactly what we are for. Gracias de nuevo. Uh, let me go now to Tbilisi, uh, all uh, at the other end of, of the world. Uh, and let me introduce the, uh, the budget department director, Ekaterina Guns Satse. Are you there, Ekaterina? Hello. Hello. Greetings from Tbilisi. Uh, Good to see you. 
We are happy to join the initiative and to be active participants of the open budget initiative and um, all the future reforms related to public finance management. Uh, so my deputy, uh, Natia Gulua, will be presenting a little bit about our uh, plans uh, in regards to the fiscal transparency. Natia, are you here? Yes. Hello. Welcome, Natia. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, I will share now my presentation. Please. Uh, okay. Do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Natia. I represent the Minister of Finance of Georgia and working as the Deputy Head of Budget Department. Uh, it's our honor to participate in the opening session as a new member of the GIFT Network as steward, and uh, we hope uh, to promote cooperation and exchange of experiences between all parties involved here. Uh, today, I will briefly uh, present public finance management reform in Georgia, uh, latest results of uh, Open Budget Survey 2019, and Budget Transparency and Public Participation Action Plan for 2020-2021. Uh, so for the past decade, Georgia has undergone through serious reforms in public finance management. So public finance management uh, that started in since 2004 included uh, in introducing a medium term ex uh, expenditure uh, framework, improving main aspects of budgeting, uh, adopting new budget code in 2019, uh, all laws regulating the whole budget system on central as well as on local level incorporated in the code. Uh, developing a legal framework for fiscal discipline by adopting Organic Law and Economic Freedom Liberty Act, which defines the fiscal rules for public finance management and uh, which ensures the legal basis for sustainable fiscal policy. Uh, establishing electronic system, electronic public finance management system, which is uh, fully harmonized for budgeting and treasury since 2012. And since 2015, all budget organizations are incorporated in the system at all level of government. Uh, moving to program budgeting since, since 2012, and we uh, start piloting program budgeting since 2009. Um, since 2009, uh, Ministry of Finance approves public finance management strategies uh, for four years and annual action plans for each year for the implementation of public finance management strategy and most representatives with the other stakeholders uh, such as State Audit Office, Parliament, Procurement Agency, donors and other civil society organizations discuss the implementation of the action plan quarterly and annually basis as the PFM Coordination Council chair by Minister or Deputy Minister of Finance. This is one of the tools to communicate effectively together with all stakeholders and share views and also discuss the questions on public interest. Um, government provides uh, extensive information for the public, mention readable format data, including citizens' budget, and all budget documentation um, is available at the Minister of Finance website. Um, Georgia is very actively monitoring the ongoing, ongoing public finance management reform. We regularly do the PEFA self-assessments. According to the 2019 Open Budget Survey conducted by the International Budget Partnership, Georgia still ranks number five among 117 countries and follows the standards of extensive transparency and um, has a significant progress since 2006, when Georgia ranked 34th uh, with the score of 66. Uh, Georgia follows practice of publicizing all the necessary documentation related to budget cycle, and information is free and available. Uh, and yeah. this slide, yes. Our, our uh, translators, I, I appreciate that you're going fast because we are a, a, a little okay, bit behind, I'm... but our translators are asking if you please go a little bit slower so okay. they can take uh, and share all of your ideas. Thank you. Okay. Uh, according to the results of uh, Open Budget Survey 2019, uh, meaningful public participation in the budget process remains scarce. Uh, we score 28 uh, out of 100, while the global average score is 14. 
out of 100. Uh, and uh, I have in this slide top 20 countries uh, assessed uh, in uh, public participation, and Georgia ranks uh, 14th among 117 countries assessed. Definitely, public participation is the hardest uh, part of achieving uh, full transparency. Uh, Ministry of Finance uh, continues to work on the development of citizens' participation mechanism in the budget uh, planning process. Uh, in 2019, uh, electronic system of budget transparency and public participation, uh, EBTPS MOPG, has been officially launched through which all citizens have the opportunity to participate in the budget planning process and receive feedback as well as to get information about budget process and budgeting issues like budget calendar, citizens guides and other budget documentations. To further strengthen public participation in the budget process, Georgia's Ministry of Finance prioritized the following actions. Uh, the first is to improve budget transparency and participation electronic system considering user needs of information uh, the section plan is for 2020 and 2021. Um, uh, the second action is to prepare communication strategy and action plan of implementing uh, electronic system in the pilot ministries. Uh, and these ministries, uh, we've selected two pilot ministries this year. These are Ministry of Regional Development and Infrastructure and Ministry of Education, Science and Culture and Sport. Uh, and uh, we have also uh, donor support, USAID, uh, USAID are supporting us in this um, uh, in implementation of this uh, communication strategy and action plan. And the third activity is to report on the public engagement in the budget planning process through the uh, EBTPS is reflected in the 2020 state budget law package and submitted to the Parliament of Georgia. Uh, all the above mentioned prove that being transparent and uh, open is a uh, priority to the Georgian government. So I would like one more time to um, uh, mention that we're pleased and honored to be part of the network and we hope to our fruitful cooperation in the future. Uh, the Minister of Finance will continue to promote the intensify and uh, intensify efforts to improve budget transparency, participation, and uh, accountability in fiscal and budgetary policies, taking into account the uh, principles of um, you know, fiscal transparency of the gift. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Natia. And welcome one more time. Uh, let me ask now Jorge Umaña, a professor of uh, the University of Costa Rica, uh, to uh, present um, uh, their plans in OVAP in Costa Rica. And then we'll go to our civil society, a, a new member organization from uh, Georgia, uh, Europe Foundation. Inovap, your turn. Hola, hola, Juan Pablo, muchísimas gracias. Hello, Juan Pablo, thank you. Que estoy compartiendo. Please let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah, mm -hmm. there it is. Excelente. Bueno, como yes, mencionó. it's there. Excellent. As Juan Pablo said, on behalf of Innovap from the Costa Rica University, I would like to greet you all. We've been, we've been working on promoting open data. This Innovap focuses on data for development. Everything that has to do with open data, our public institutions, the use of public data, projects that have to do with science and data analysis and visualization. And something new that we're working on has to do with open data and government and institutions. Basically, we want to promote innov innovative, in programs to promote open data. Within an InnovApp, uh, we're working on different things. Eric talked about what we wanted to do with the open data school, as well as the good results that we achieved. It had to do with the need of involving different stakeholders and also uh, to talk about public budget we wanted to also develop technic 
technical requirements about um, open data. And we also focused on promoting data in order to improve public, our public budget. I don't want to repeat what Eric talked about, but basically what we wanted to do was uh, develop skills and capabilities within certain stakeholders that may not have been involved in the public budget process before. For example, data users in general, citizens in general, researchers, journalists that one way or another work on issues that are of interest for the general public, but maybe that didn't work on budget before. In addition to this, in the open data school, we have a multi-stakeholder space, learning space. Eric is coordinating this um, space and he's the, he works for the Minister of Finance. He said that he learned a lot throughout the process and we thought uh, we were going to be the ones to, that were going to learn, but they also learned a lot. We were happy to count or to have the participation of different stakeholders that learned a lot about open data and budgets that we improved that way, not only transparency, but also available tools. And then there was a lot of experience exchanges at a national level to an international level. In general, the Open Data School was a very successful experience. It's an empowering space where people understand or learn about the different stages of the budget process. They learn how to read the data. And that way we educate citizens. In the Open School, process, basically we have different stages. The first one has to do with the national budget. The second part has to do with open data in general. There is a third module that focuses on open budget standards so that participants in the training get to understand the standard and why it is important to have an international standard. Once we address all those different concepts, we focus on the data laboratory. Basically, that's when the COVID pandemic started, we had to move to a virtual mode. And at the last stage is an innovation lab. We basically focus on exploring new data. As you can see, because of COVID, we had to move from a, an in-person type of setup to a virtual setup. But we saw very good results. Basically, participants adjusted very quickly. Like Eric said, um, one of the things that we are thinking about is to actually move fully virtually for next year. In order to complete the training, we thought it would be very interesting to analyze a product specific and come up with a paper that participants could submit. We developed a mini uh, example that we called Explora Datos. Participants had to follow certain steps within this process and they had to come up with their own projects and they were very interesting. Our Explora Datos basically divided the participants by teams and we could work on different sessions. The important thing in this case was that participants already knew each other, so it was much easier for them to work together and coordinate. We had 10 projects, very interesting, with uh, topics, uh, current topics, uh, health budgets and analyzing the budgets of one of the most important budget initiatives in the country and everything that has to do with educational infrastructure, also analysis of program budgets, formal education here in Costa Rica to look at the employment or the unemployment gap and how they finance opportunities that are given to the citizens in these areas. So we have these six projects and we gave awards to the first three. The 
third was a process of visualization and communication that was very practical from the National Employment Program. And they not only provided built skills, but they also worked with the uh, private sector to understand employability demands. And obviously all of these projects first had to analyze the data in the, uh, according to the criteria of open data. And then we had much more specific um, goals. In the second place here, there was a group called Mission Pupitre, where the Liliana and Carla have to do information transfer to education boards uh, as they budgeted for improving educational infrastructure. And because we realized that there were schools that had had bathrooms closed for 10 years, for example, because they hadn't assigned money to improvements in the budget. So they called the project Mission Pupitre, a little bit like Mission Impossible, but Pupitre means the student's desk. And they were following up public expenditures in this component. And the women that are working in public procurement nationally uh, won the group that won this award they realized that the procurement plans of different institutions are totally different. So they developed two tools. One was uh, acquisitions standards for the government agencies and so that they could fit with the strategic guidelines of the state. And secondly, a tool that systematizes in a very simple ways what the uh, government procurement plans are and how that's incorporated into the budget. And so uh, we would have loved to have given awards to all of the projects, but these three won awards. And um, we're hoping that their projects can be implemented now after they have been developed. And so this is all part of open spending. And we're so happy to be part of the group of stewards of GIFT and thank you so much to Lorena and Juan Pablo because we've been talking about these issues for years. And Eric had already told you a little bit about the importance of working very closely in collaboration so that we can understand what the Ministry of Finance is doing and what civil society requires. And so the um, Open Budget School closed about two weeks ago. We're going to document the experience now and get that information out to the Gift Stewards Group. And this year, we're also going to be incubating two new projects proposed uh, for implementation in the future. We're also going to be working on Explora Datos 2021 to make sure that uh, we can repeat the good results that the initiative has had. And as Eric said, we'll have the second version or the second class of the Open Budget School, and we'll be having that in a virtual format. And it's going to be the, on the e-learning platform of the Ministry of Finance. And they have a lot of ability to virtualize the school and to allow the school to reach many more people, not just the 30 that we were able to accept into the program previously, but to leave it open to anybody who might like to get training on this issue of open data and open budgets at any time using the time that they have. And finally, since we're also working with academia, we want to develop more initiatives for data use that has to do with research analysis on budgets and critical analysis on improving budgets. So that's our action plan. And since we're new, Costa Rica is a small country that's in the Americas or in Central America between Panama and Nicaragua. Sometimes we're confused uh, with one of the Caribbean countries. So we wanted to clarify that. We also want to invite you when it's all possible again and everything's normal that you come to visit us, not just to talk about good experiences in open budgeting and 
and transparent budgeting, budgeting, but also to get to know the country. So it looks like I've already done the work of putting together a background that has to do with my country. Thank you. between the government and the civil society in our new members from Costa Rica. Welcome. Uh, let me go now to uh, the Europe Foundation, Ketevan Vasakitsi. Keri, are you there? Here today. Um, and hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here. Uh, and hello. To be part, to become a part of the network. Um, I also want to congratulate Gift Team as they did an amazing job in uh, the first session. And I hope that's how it will continue during the week. Um, um, I think already the first session um, showed to us that uh, we're in the right place because we joined Gift because we want to learn more see the opportunities of sharing our work as well, get your feedback, but also maybe create something that will also contribute to the overall work of the network. So, and what I've seen there, like um, uh, the presentation that I've heard today were very interesting with uh, very specific examples that uh, I think some of them can be replicated here in Georgia as well. So, um, um, we uh, discovered the gift last year um, for last year and because um, uh, Europe Foundation that I represent has been um, involving different group of civil society groups whether community groups or more um, advanced civil society NGOs into the uh, social political decision making uh, and economic decision making in Georgia over 25 years now and um, um, especially lately, we have been working on the fiscal engaging civil society group in the uh, budgetary process and the fiscal uh, policy making. And what we've seen, as it was uh, mentioned uh, earlier today, Georgia made an amazing progress in terms of the uh, uh, fiscal uh, policy making and improving the fiscal uh, policy making. And I want to share the screen. Um, I don't know if you can see. Can you see my screen? Which is basically the, yep. the screen of the, um, the open budget survey. And you can see that uh, in terms of transparency and budget oversight, Georgia ranks very high. But in terms of public participation, it lags behind. And this is something we have been um, experimenting uh, and we have been experiencing in our work for some time and you have been very frustrated so we are looking for the um, network that will help us to work together towards improving the score but not just for score of course but to see also what are the best ways and best examples how we can engage civil society groups into the fiscal policy uh, making and um, we have been working with different groups including the uh, groups uh, that represent disability, people with disabilities, persons with disabilities. And um, there is, uh, and what we saw that on one side, you have the government of Georgia that is trying, but maybe lacks uh, experience in engaging public into the um, budgetary process. But on the other side, we have a civil society that also lacks capacity to understand the process. So we have been doing and we will continue to do uh, thematic capacity building events and training for our uh, beneficiaries. Um, but we also um, will, as we looked at the gift, we will, together with you, we want to do more of public awareness campaign to promote gift principles in Georgia. All with the government agency, but mm, more, of course, with the um, civil society groups. And if um, they're very interesting, um, uh, on public participation, if you see its course, as I mentioned, on 28, but when you look at how the score is made, you see that in terms of uh, legislative approval or audit and supreme audit institutions involvement, they, again, it's course high, but there's a zero to uh, in 19, there is a zero on formulation uh, and implementation um, on the engagement of um, uh, the various groups. 
So um, the recommendation there is to pilot some of the mechanisms to engage public in during the budget formulation and then to monitor the budget implementation and uh, also actively engage with different underrepresented communities uh, or through the civil society organization. And this is basically what we have been doing for many years and then we want, we want to continue to do. So as I mentioned, at one side, uh, have more debates and discussions on challenges to civil engagement in policy making in general and in fiscal policy. We want, we also are facilitating, we're bringing different voices, including disability groups, but also other un underrepresented communities. And we have a CSO platform for budget transparency um, um, they, where we unite these groups together so that their voice is heard. But we will more intensively now with the uh, participation of some of the gift experts, we'll do more of the more trainings uh, for the groups, uh, civil society groups. Um, and uh, we're also uh, going to do more of the studies on the challenges of civil engagement and what are the best ways to engage. Um, and uh, one other thing that we're focusing on right now, it's how uh, Georgia develops more consumer oriented social services because there are very few social services in Georgia and they're very um, uh, and it's mostly cash based. Um, the assistance programs are mostly cash based. So this is where we want to involve these groups so that they are part of the budgetary process through developing the social services that will um, uh, benefit them and we will get results out of this. And this is will translate into the numbers and the budgets. And um, as a we're um, advocacy organization, but we're also grant maker as a foundation. So we'll continue to give more grants to our partners so that they pilot mechanisms to engage the public in uh, budget formulation and then to monitor the implementation. So I, and I understand that while I'm one of the last presenter uh, today. So um, I will be very brief and stop there, but I really look forward to meeting uh, some of the or all of you in live and learning more from, and I, again, I learned uh, already a lot and I will follow up on this, uh, on some of these presentations. Thank you very much. so strongly the question of inclusion uh, that's uh, really something uh, we believe in and it's great to have you uh, uh, as part of the network we'll be working on that with you go back to america and uh, uh, we have two more organizations before the break uh, CIEP from mexico and fundación solidaridad from the dominican republic hector villarreal my my dear friend are you there? Sí, Juan Pablo, muchas gracias. Yes, Juan Pablo, thank you very much. Before anything else, I want to say that I feel very honored that we were able to be considered as stewards. I also want to congratulate you for putting together such an ambitious week of work. And I think you are a very important global actor in budget discussions and transparency discussions. And after seeing such in interesting presentations, I am very sure that we have the key people here necessary for this network. So thank you very, very much for including us. Basically, I would like to share the screen with you right now and I'll do it in just a few minutes. But I'd like to talk very quickly about six things that we're working on as an organization that we think can help transparency. I know we're a little bit behind time, so I'll try to be very brief. First of all is that from, 
in terms of the Ministry of uh, Finance, we definitely are users of this information. We try to do accessible analyses. Both on the spending side as well as the income side. There is a problem with budgetary information here. If we do have organizations with experiences, we'd love to see the collaboration. So on one hand, we have secondary sources. Sorry, the interpreter is not getting a clear audio feed. Mexico has great data on the spending side. On the income side, um, I want to show this to you. Again, the audio is spotty here. It's very important that people understand administrative data. Having good administrative data is very important to be able to model a series of possible taxes. And so that's the second issue that's very related that I don't want to leave out. We are working in a significant way in a new version of our budgetary simulator and I hope to be able to share our progress in that area soon. We'll send it to the network. Here we had an experience that was very interesting. Our last budgetary simulator was good, but it was relatively hard to use. On the other hand, we're now we're going to have a much simpler version, which I think can be very important important to talk about uh, budgetary and fiscal reform. The two other things very quickly, we were able to participate in gathering data. And I think that we should work more on that area. I want to congratulate the Ministry of Financing and Budget for the effort. It was excellent effort that was done. And on other matters, as an organization, we have realized that while technical work has a very important role to play, communications is equally important. We have many new researchers in our organization, many young people. And what we've done in the last two or three weeks is, is a training, in fact, training on storytelling. And I think that experience is going to be very important. I think that's going to help us to reach a larger public and help us to increase our transparency in that way. So Juan Pablo, Lorena, uh, everyone, it's been an honor to participate. I'm going to stop for a moment here. And different members of the organization will be participating throughout the week. So I hope we'll have opportunities to share a little bit more information. And I'd also like to ask some questions from the very interesting presentations that have already been made. Thank you very much. In, in depth in some of these very important issues. Uh, bear with us. Uh, this was the most challenging long session, uh, but um, we might extend a little bit uh, uh, our session, but uh, all of the uh, dear stewards that have been patiently waiting, I, I thank you so much. We will get to you soon. Uh, now to Santo Domingo with my dear friend Juan Castillo, Fundación Solidaridad.
I saw you this morning. Gracias, Juan. Juan Pablo. Are you there? Buenos días. Ah, there you are. Thank you. This is Juan Castillo from the Dominican Republic. We're very excited and very grateful to be part of this prestigious network. And we're willing to get involved to learn and to follow through on gift principles. We have a brief presentation here about the basic uh, aspects of our work plan. The Fundación Solidaridad has been in existence for three, 30 years and has focused on promoting citizen participation, transparency, and accountability in public processes. Since 1999, we were pioneers in a participatory municipal budgeting process in the Dominican Republic. And we were able to include in a national law that orients public uh, public policies uh, the some aspects of budgetary transparency in this framework we're involved in the public the open budget survey with the ibp and in two, from 2008 to 2019 this survey thanks to the efforts of ibp and others has been evolving continuously. We got 12 points in 2008, and from that we, have, we went up to 75 points in the last measurement. So I think the Dominican Republic has been gradually increasing our score, and now we're in an enviable position. In some levels, referring to citizen participation in the budgetary process, the Dominican Republic received only 31 points. In this context, we have an initiative that allows us to update our plan, taking into account two situations. One is the pandemic crisis, which has made us change the way that we act from uh, in-person events to virtual events. The other thing that's happened in the Dominican Republic is a change of government. Our current administration has only been in office for one week. And so we've been working on advocacy for citizen participation on budgetary policy and citizen participation in the Dominican Republic. And we have a new focus for that. And so we'll be doing advocacy so that the new government and the new authorities in the Ministry of uh, the Treasury and the Economy can meet the recommendations of the 2019 budget survey. Increasing budget transparency and other plans. In this sense, we're proposing new efforts Uh, for joint initiatives. The government has a good attitude. The, the new officials that we've talked with are really interested in transparency, and so we've had open conservation, uh, conversations with the Ministry of Economy and the General Budget Office. And they're very interested in this uh, program for the new government. So what we believe to uh, comply with the com commitment that we have with GIFT, OGP, and IBP. Uh, we'll be able to work on citizen participation and an initiative that will improve public participation in the budget process. And we're going to do that through a pilot project. And it models ways in which the public can participate in the budgetary process. We're also thinking of a joint working roundtable between civil society and the government to be able to talk about proposed policies of transparency. Another initiative that is pending is to get involved more actively in 
mm, the measurements of the open budget survey and to articulate that with the uh, credibility and uh, reliability of the budgeting process. So with a group of the public that is pressuring the government for more transparency. We're hoping to intensify citizen tra uh, training through courses that we provide and by forming partnerships with civil society organizations on budgetary transparency and citizen participation in the process. We have joined a number of networks um, that can help us uh, work with the government. And we'll continue to develop advocacy campaigns and education campaigns in the social networks. That's been an effective area of work. And so knowing that we don't have very much time here, uh, we want to just give this uh, presentation to GIFT and be in conversation with Lorena and Juan Pablo uh, to be able to learn and to contribute to this process. So thank you very much for having us here and a greetings to everyone. Juan, uh, now you can see uh, how much stronger the GIFT network is with these six new members. One, once again, welcome. Um, let me ask before we take the break, uh, which is going to be a short break, if we have around uh, Mauricio Sosa um, from uh, the Ministry of Finance from El Salvador. He has a busy agenda and he requested to uh, come in uh, the floor as soon as possible. If we can listen to him for three minutes, Mauricio, if you please, tres minutos before the break. Estás por ahí, Mauricio. Bienvenido. Muy buenos días a todos y a todas. Good morning. Greetings, Greetings to, to everyone in the Ministry of and to Treasure. everyone that is participating in this initiative on fiscal transparency. I am the Vice Director of Fiscal Policy from the Ministry of Finance of El Salvador, and I was asked to participate in this very important event. I wanted to share something with you. The, minister, the Ministry of Finance has increasingly made efforts in order to make information available for the public about public finance management specialized studies and reports on different issues that have to do with taxes. Currently, given the situation that we're undergoing, we've also published different documents about the fiscal impact of the crisis of the pandemic, and we've also published economic and financial measures that we are implementing in order to solve all the negative impacts of the pandemic. Right now, or so far, we are focusing on promoting an action, a three year action plan from 2020 to 2022. And it has three main components. The, they focus on coordinating actions to bring, to make transparency cross-cutting among institutions, dissemination of information in a timely manner, improving also the quality of public management, public finance management. We are also working on promoting the tools of the fourth industrial revolution. We have to tap into social media and state-of-the-art technology in order to improve access to all this information by the public so that they can see 
how resources are being used and what is being done in order to improve fiscal transparency in the country. A third component, specific actions in order to strengthen and increase benefits by the assistance provided by international organizations, multilateral agencies, as well as national entities. In 2015, my country joined this initiative. We've managed to improve. We have also increased the number of products that are available for the public and also their quality. Therefore, we are continuously working on getting better. We exchange information through dialogues such as this one. And we, I believe we will continue to move forward gradually. It is, like I said, a great pleasure for me to participate in this forum here with all of you. Thank you so much. Welcome back, El Salvador. Gracias nuevamente. Um, Time for okay, us to take, gracias Mauricio, to take a, a short break. Let's take a, a five minute break uh, and then we'll have the challenge to do in 40 minutes uh, uh, what we were supposed to do in, in, in something about one hour. But we have um, a Minister of Finance such as Liberia, Guatemala, Colombia, uh, beautiful, wonderful organizations such as the OECD from Paris, uh, uh, Global Integrity. Please. Uh, uh, bear with us, stay with us. We'll see you in five minutes. Go get a good cup of coffee. If it's time, like in Paris, you can go for a glass of wine. Why not? Pourquoi pas? A tout à l'heure. See you now. So let's um, start okay. uh, again. Uh, let's resume the meeting. Let me ask. Um, uh, if we have uh, in, in the room Andrew Blasi, Lacey, Deputy Head of the Division of Budget and Public Expenditure, OECD. Are you there, Andrew? And uh, uh, let me also ask our dear friends from Liberia, our uh, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Honorable Minister Samuel Tui, or uh, the Deputy Minister Taneth Bronson, to uh, start getting ready. And uh, also, Rodrigue Chaou. Est-ce que vous êtes là, Monsieur le Directeur Général? Uh, General Director Are you there, uh, General Director of the Budget in Benin? And after that, I'm going to ask Catherine from Open Contracting Partnership, if you are still there. I'm here, Juan Pablo, and I'm ready to present whenever well, you need me to. Don't so worry. I can, could, could, you, could you go ahead now? Of course, definitely. Let me grab. So, yeah. Please go ahead. Take your time. Uh, uh, after after Catherine, we uh, again. Any of these people that I just mentioned are welcome to come in. The challenge, dear colleagues, is uh, going to. Uh, we're going to try to be a little bit more strict with 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 time. We needed to be very generous with the new members, but now uh, we might uh, remind you uh, uh, when you have one minute left that uh, that's your time. So we accommodate to uh, uh, the three minutes. Uh, so whenever we're getting close to that, I will let you know. Catherine, uh, Open Contracting Partnership. How are you? I'm good, thank you for having me. And maybe I can ask Lorena for a favor. I, we prepared a memo that we are happy to share with you all. For whatever reason, I cannot type in the chat message right now. So maybe Lorena can share it yeah. um, with everyone. It will be easier Do you want me to, paste to follow. It completely? Oh no, maybe just a link, right? Um, I made it okay. so that everyone can access it. I don't Thank know why you. we okay. can't type right now. Do you want me to share the screen? 
I think if you just put the link in, people can click on it. I think that's okay. Great, thank you. All right, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Katrin Frauscher. I'm the Deputy Executive Director with the Open Contracting Partnership. And it's a pleasure to be here and hear all of your um, presentations and um, to meet you all. It's um, sad that this year we won't have the meeting in person, but um, as they said before, it uh, also means I think we have more countries represented that uh, it's great to, to hear and learn from all of you. So at the Open Contracting Partnership, we work on a very similar issue as GIFT, but instead of looking at budgets, we look at public contracts and procurement. And um, I think as all of you know, um, the COVID crisis has thrown public procurement into the spotlights. Um, you know, my parents, I think, never really knew what I was working on, but now that they read the news about um, contracting gone wrong and ventilators being uh, very expensive or not arriving, they also understand what I'm what I'm working on. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about in the next two minutes, and I promise um, to stick to time, is that um, for us, the COVID-19 crisis has really shown that the vision uh, of open contracting, of having open, public, easy to use uh, procurement data that are connected to budget data and include spending data, and where you work with civil society, government and private sector together has come true. Because we can see that countries that are practicing open contracting and are using the open contracting data standard and are partnering with civil society, were able to plan, buy and deliver contracts better. So some of those countries are present here. They are um, Colombia, Moldova, Ecuador, Paraguay, Ukraine. So you can see there's a big overlap in the countries um, where open contracting is being practiced and where uh, open budgets are important. And what did these countries do to see their success? So they, they changed some of their policies. So they made sure that even during open um, emergency procurements, they still had to publish data. They centralized and coordinated their procurement functions. Perhaps very important for this meeting here, they tagged all of their contracting processes to show that these are COVID-19 related contracting processes. And also some of them like Paraguay was able to link it to budget data, was made the tracking um, much more effective. And we have also seen that collaboration with partners really matters. So if you're in a country you know, where the government perhaps has less capacities right now to do some of those things, we have seen the big role that civil society and also journalists can play. And I think that will be a topic of later sessions as well, because they were able to hold their government for, to account and to demand uh, more and better procurement and budgeting processes by doing that. So in the memo, we share some detailed of examples of what Paraguay or Moldova um, and others have been able to do. In Moldova, for example, a coalition of governments and civil society came together and within only 13, uh, 30 days, they were able to collect and publish the emergency uh, procurement data. And that's now being used to monitor both from the public sector side as well as from the civil society side. Um, so how can we help you? If you're working at the intersection of budgeting and procurement, we can help you with some of the things that I already mentioned, such as policy advice. Um, on data. Lorena in her opening remarks mentioned how the open data fiscal uh, package now shows how you can link budget and procurement data. So that is something we can help you with. But also how you use some of those budget and procurement data to do better monitoring so that you know that as a citizen or as a civil society organization, but other, also as a government agency that is looking for effectiveness and efficiency can uh, get better results and do um, better tracking. So going forward, um, unfortunately, COVID doesn't seem to go anywhere. So it will stay with us and therefore also be a priority for us um, moving forward. Um, following on the remarks that we just heard, we also have a big focus on inclusion and equity um, over the next 12 months, because we are seeing all over the world that um, women, minority-owned businesses, and just underrepresented communities are getting the hurt the most by this crisis and are often left out in the budgeted, budgeting and procurement processes. So we will especially uh, focus and work with them going forward. And let me end by uh, saying, do reach out to us in the memo. We are sharing our contact details. We would love to work with you. If you want to work on budget and procurement uh, together, please let us know. But we also want to document that what you have done. I think one of the great advantages of having fora like this is that we can learn from each other and share you know, what's working and what is hard. 
So if in your work or in your colleagues' work, you have seen how you tackled procurement challenges during this time, please send me an email. We would love to write them up and share them with our community. And um, if you have any questions, just write them in the chat and I'm happy to answer them during the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen, for um, uh, being so uh, complete in your presentation and at the same time taking care of time. Very appreciated. Andrew from the OECD, Andrew Blasey, are you there? I see your picture. Let me also ask Fergus from the Emerging Market Alliance to, to start getting ready. Uh, we will also call Carmela. Carmela, you're next. Let me just see if Andrew is there. It's in Paris a bit late. I'm here, here, Juan. Welcome. Good to see you. Your turn. Good the floor see, is yours. Good to see you as well. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So wonderful to uh, see how strong a participation uh, we have on this opening session with uh, you know, over 80 people uh, joining at one point. Uh, and also particularly fascinating to listen to all of the uh, interesting developments uh, that has occurred across, uh, across countries. Uh, as you know, OECD uh, has 37 uh, members uh, and the most recent being Colombia. So very interesting to, to hear from Colombia today. Uh, and uh, probably with our, our work on um, budgeting and public management, which is the area that uh, I, I am involved in, uh, would spend uh, at least half of my time working with non-members. Uh, countries that uh, and organizations that partner with the OECD. Uh, GIFT is one of those and uh, we, we really enjoy working with GIFT and with the um, experts that GIFT has, has available to it uh, and, uh, and you know that underscores I think um, uh, why we're keenly um, participating today and, and during the week. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the um, framework that uh, that we use in this area, some of the results from a, a survey uh, that we undertook and uh, some of the work that we have going on uh, following the outbreak of uh, COVID. Uh, because of, of uh, the constraints on, on time and, and also on all of our, uh, our concentration spans, I can uh, uh, promise you that I only have uh, two slides uh, and that uh, uh, won't, won't take you through uh, Thank any, more, you. any more than that. Look, this slide here is one that uh, my predecessor uh, developed uh, and it uh, shows the 10 dimensions in the OECD's framework on um, budgetary governance. And I, I like this because uh, uh, it was prepared in 2015 and has actually become the sort of brand uh, sometimes it's hard to illuminate a, uh, a framework. I find this does it very well and it's super relevant to GIFT because transparency is in the center of it. Uh, and uh, I think that's quite fitting in terms of, of the importance. Um, this uh, uh, framework, we conducted a survey in 2018 that uh, a large volume was published uh, uh, last year with all of the uh, findings. And uh, on the transparency, you know, there was a really positive story that showed that on uh, budget documents across OECD countries, all of them had become more transparent in their use of, of uh, budgeting documents. Uh, the two areas that had the greatest gains were long-term fiscal statements and reviews on uh, budget forecasts in terms of reviewing the accuracy of assumptions and, and, uh, and the analysis. Uh, so, you know, particular dimensions that were gaining uh, uh, greater exposure there, while all of the others were, were improving, they were the two with, with the greatest. And on citizens' budgets, again, a very uh, significant increase in the number of countries uh, undertaking uh, and preparing citizens' budgets and, and yet at the same time, still a really challenging uh, area because uh, where those citizens' budgets were available online, uh, the number of visits to those sites still remain low. Uh, and that really creates sort of a, a question about 
um, is it the right material? It, it may have the right intent and the right objective, but something's not quite there yet in some cases where the uh, uh, exposure rate or the click rate is, uh, is still low. So really fascinating today to hear uh, this morning about uh, e-books and some of the other um, innovations that may push that uh, area along further. Um, as we've heard too uh, today, participation, uh, participatory budget practices are also a very um, difficult area and one where uh, there have been great gains in countries like uh, Mexico and, and Korea uh, on this, but uh, uh, they stand out as the exceptions across the, the OECD uh, membership on this. So uh, there's nothing about the OECD, meaning that uh, participatory budgeting is widespread. This is an area that this needs to, uh, where, where further work can occur as well. Now, last year we undertook a uh, implementation report that we then reviewed this uh, uh, framework in terms of, of three years of, of use um, by, by members, uh, which is why I introduced it as being 2015. Um, uh, really to show that when we undertook that review, and, and I think it was healthy that we're not only reviewing our own work and seeing where it could be improved, but making those results available. Uh, it showed that, that it was relevant, uh, that all the countries were using it, but that uh, there were areas like participation where, where further gains uh, are possible. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, to help with the promotion and the distribution of that, for some reason, I'm just having trouble clicking through to the uh, next slide. There we go. Apologies. Uh, we have uh, networks that bring people uh, together. Our two main ones are the senior budget officials uh, and one, one change for us since the last meeting of the stewards is uh, that public employment and management has joined our work on budgeting. So what used to be called the budgeting division is now um, budgeting and public management division here at the OECD. And if you're looking for a model in another country, think of the US uh, OMB, Office of Management and Budget, in terms of those two uh, coming together, uh, uh, two functions coming together. Now, these networks that, that exist within that, that are listed one to seven there, uh, uh, participation has been increasing year on year there. Some are directly relevant to uh, um, fiscal transparency, as you'll see with the, with the first three. The, the four to seven, also very relevant, but I kind of think of them as being a lens into fiscal uh, transparency. And for example, with uh, green budgeting, is one where uh, one of uh, GIFT's experts came in and joined our latest workshop uh, on that. Uh, in the period that we've had this framework, we've had over 50 meetings across these networks uh, and still some uh, even in this period of uh, virtual meetings like the steward meeting where most recently we've had one with uh, Latin America and Caribbean uh, senior budget officials. We've also had a workshop on, uh, on, on gender budgeting as well with over, over half of OECD countries undertaking uh, work on, on gender budgeting, plus many non-OECD uh, countries as, as well. Uh, and so uh, that's kept the momentum going, certainly very strong demand, uh, and that demand's uh, ever um, uh, evident with uh, COVID-19. Uh, what we're seeing there is a particular emphasis around uh, three things. One is on oversight and the fact that many parliaments were um, suspended uh, or rose, as, as I think this uh, phrase is, uh, which is questioned about uh, what scrutiny was applied to expenditure and how that occurs uh, either in successive waves of COVID-19. Uh, another one is the... the um, uh, um, uh, sorry, I'm going to just look at my notes. Uh, the other one is on on uh, the extra budget. Uh, I'm just pausing there because I was really delighted the IMF we can refer to this as well because we do a fiscal risk work program is one that we're doing work together uh, on. And the third one that I think is ever important, particularly after the last presentation on contracting, is that the control environment in many countries has been relaxed. 
Uh, and so each of those have, has implications on transparency. They certainly have implications on the uh, kind of requirements that are set when uh, uh, public resources are allocated to uh, new areas or expanded areas. All of this is creating, I think, pressure on uh, upcoming budgets, and we're certainly finding that with our engagement with, uh, with countries for the, the coming year's uh, uh, budget. And I think that makes uh, this particular uh, week uh, with uh, stewards uh, very timely in terms of exposing some of the good practices across countries. We'll certainly be uh, keenly uh, looking at them and seeing uh, how to leverage and what can be shared uh, and really looking forward to participating in the coming weeks, in the coming week. So with that, thank you very much and look forward to talking more over the days ahead. Thank you so much, Andrew, and uh, greetings to the team and particularly uh, give a big hug on my behalf whenever it's possible because we still need to keep the social distance to John Blondal. Yes, so John's, uh, John gives his apologies for not being here. This just coincides with a, a holiday back home for him. But as you know, he's a very big advocate uh, of GIFT and looks for any opportunity possible to cooperate together. I know that. Thank you. Okay. Let's go now to Brazil. Uh, Carmela, my apologies again. Carmela Sigoni, INESC, founding member Hi. of the GIFT Network. Your turn. And please, uh, Leonardo Buitrago, as, as mentioned, and Fergus, Leonardo from Colombia, Fergus, uh, start getting ready. Tres minutos, Carmela. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Pablo. So very much for the opportunity. I'm at the Institute for Socioeconomic Studies. So related, uh, uh, what we are doing here uh, in asking us to work to increase fiscal transparency in Brazil, monitoring the government and doing advocacy, a lot of advocacy in these days. Uh, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Brazilian government has been trying to disrupt the mechanisms of transparency and access to information. An example happened in March uh, with the addition by presidency of a provisional measure changing the access to information law, ending deadlines to provide data and allow to deny requests. Build the effectiveness of the measure in April. However, during its brief period, the measure was used access to information in mental sectors. The government has also blocked of quality data in relation to the pandemic. As example is the underreporting of cases, with Brazil being one of the countries that performs the least number of tests in the world and also does not publish official testing data on the official website. In June, the Ministry of Health removed a part of the data from the official website and when he published it, uh, omitted the accumulated data of pandemic in an attempt to minimize the scale of contamination. After pressure from various sectors of society, the accumulated data was republished on the website. In addition, most of the available data is not in an open format and do not have ethnic, racial, or gender information. Today, Brazil has more than 3,600,000 cases and almost 115,000 deaths from coronavirus. But the lack of data transparency makes us believe that the number is much higher. In relation to these acts, INESC held a technical meeting with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights in July, where presented the situation of low transparency to rapporteur uh, Joel Hernandez Garcia. INESC also acted to denounce how budget cuts in social policies left Brazil unable to face the pandemic, launching in April the report Brazil with Low Immunity. Uh, in this report, uh, we can find many data, but um, the most important is health was underfunded by 
four billion dollars with cuts from the, uh, 2015 to 2019. Sanitation policies lost 20% of investments in the same period and funds to promote scientific results I have. Uh, a major achievement led uh, by UNESCO was the approval by the of emergency income uh, um, against the will of President Jair Bolsonaro. This program aims to benefit more than 50 million Brazilians in extreme poverty with a monthly payment of $100 for workers uh, who have earned less than this year. However, the in absence of civil documentation has limited the access for people who need it most. Uh, another victory in the, in the last week was approval uh, of the law that provides protection measures for indigenous and quilombola communities. Shocking, but not surprising, the president tried to veto devices that provide access to drink water, hygiene materials, hosts to these communities. The analysis of subfinancing of indigenous health carried out by the NESC supported the public audience in parliament and was disseminated in the media in, in the largest television station in the country, Global. Although the hate of contamination among white and black people is similar, blacks die more in Brazil. The lethality rate it for them lack 55%. The situation was reported in a side event at High Level Political Forum by UNESCO. And this week, we will lead a public hearing uh, at the COVID-19 External Commission at National Congress to discuss the impacts of pandemic on Black and Quilombola populations, presenting the budget information about that. Uh, the pandemic has also increased the domestic violence in the country. Uh, uh, the ways of combating this situation are limited by a scenario of underfinancing of policies for women at the local level and low implementation of national resources. The Ministry of Women, Family and Human Rights executed less than 15% of the available budget. Regarding the budget releases to face the crisis by means of extraordinary credits, the government executed six in ASC reported that June this figure was only 30%. Finally, the parliament is working remotely with very few mechanisms that allow the participation of society. In theory, parliamentarians should only be voting laws on the pandemic and elections that take place this year. But in practice, they have tried to vote many bills, including the tax reform uh, that was not uh, um, uh, discussed with society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carmela. Always sharing incredible experiences and, and the efforts uh, for the best of, of your country, Brazil. Uh, and uh, this couple of um, um, recent experiences where you make sure that programs that address uh, and include uh, marginalized and poor communities are, are very important for us to look at and learn from. Thank you so much. Uh, the government uh, of Brazil representative apologized for this session. Uh, they couldn't make it, but they would be part of a couple of sessions throughout the week and they're still willing to uh, work as much as possible uh, in, in fiscal transparency with, with, within the network. Let me now go to uh, Fergus from the Emerging Market Alliance. After that, we will go to Colombia. Uh, I know we're over time. Uh, dear friends, uh, such as um, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities are waiting. We'll, if, if you bear with us, we can stay for a bit longer. Uh, if, if you need to go, send me a message and I'll do my best to uh, make you uh, intervene as, as soon as possible. But now, Fergus, please, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, I'm Fergus McCormick, uh, Director of Sovereign Research at the Emerging Markets Investors Alliance. And 
Juan Pablo and everyone else at GIFT, uh, thank you so much for this kind invitation to, to present our initiatives uh, to enhance fiscal transparency. So this network, I think, is a very uh, important uh, component of our efforts. So thank you so much again. Now, the Alliance, as many of you know, is a 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization. And we have three initiatives to enhance fiscal transparency through education and through advocacy. The first is we write fiscal governance briefs. And these briefs include countries in Latin America and Africa and Middle East and Asia. Um, and they're a synopsis of the current state of disclosure across the public sector, beginning with the central government budget and then extending to other components of the public sector balance sheet when relevant. Um, now we use the IMF fiscal transparency code as a skeleton and then we embellish or we enhance the skeleton um, with input from our partners. Uh, and we partner with many of, uh, of you who are here with the International Budget Partnership, the Open Contracting Partnership, uh, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, the Open Government Partnership, uh, the International Public Sector Accounting Standard Board, and, and others. And it's good to see so many of you on the call. Second, we host several speaker series, and you're all very welcome to join these discussions, uh, in which we invite our policy partners, uh, investors interested in sustainability, officials from uh, the international financial institutions, and then other policy experts. And the point of these discussions is to engage individuals and also to emphasize the importance of fiscal transparency in debt oversight and also environmental sustainability. Third, and I think most important, um, at the Alliance, we have a unique model to improve fiscal transparency. After consulting our policy partners, um, we ask institutional investors to urge finance ministries, budget offices, debt management organizations to publish particular areas of public finances that they are not in fact publishing. And our philosophy is that if government officials uh, hear directly from the investors who are lending money, they will be receptive to increasing the quality and the quantity of their reports, their fiscal reporting. So these three initiatives, the fiscal reports, the speaker series and investor advocacy are ongoing. And I think it's very important to recognize there has been an outpouring of interest, particularly in the COVID era, by investors in fiscal transparency. I think investors hate uncertainty and the more fiscal information they have, the better they can assess sovereign risk and also push greater transparency itself. So I think as a result of this increasing interest, you know, we're gaining traction in, in raising awareness in the private sector, particularly among sovereign bond investors, of the importance of fiscal transparency and public financial management to improve governance overall. So thank you so much again. I uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Fergus. Uh, we like very much your intervention uh, and your uh, membership uh, because uh, you are a, a very, uh, well, not only a, a very strong representative of the private sector, but one that, that pushes very strongly this, this important uh, uh, um, efforts and causes. So thank you. Uh, Leonardo Buitrago, are you still there? Sorry, my good friend from Colombia, the Ministry of Finance. And after that, we'll hear from Romel Rodriguez, Funde, El Salvador. I see Daniel Cerebro, I see Squicota. If, if, if you dear people can stay with us, we have time to uh, have a chance. And, and uh, have you also Julieta Iscurdia, uh, we will have you, of course, record it. So we'll keep this very important session for other people that had to leave to come back and, and hear your messages. So again, Leonardo. Thank you, Juan Pablo. Bienvenido. Uh, thank you. Good morning and good afternoon and night. Good evening. Uh, to everyone, all members of uh, the network. I think I will uh, uh, shift to Spanish um, in order to, to uh, do my presentation only in three minutes. 
Uh, maybe you are already seeing gracias, the slides. Gracias. Yes, Leonardo, we can see them. Uh, yes, uh, gracias a todos. Um, okay, thank you to everyone. And thanks so much to all of you for sharing the experiences that you have in your participation today. It's great in these meetings to be able to learn from the experiences of so many countries. Thank you to Juan Pablo and the whole network for all of the support that we've received in this last year from 2019. And we're gonna tell you a little bit about what the progress has been. And thanks also to the, for the help from the guiding hands of Lorena and others in gift. Basically, what we want to tell you is has to do with our progress at high levels. We are at, uh, in the middle of the presidential term in Colombia. About a year ago or a little bit more, Our national development plan was unveiled and it really emphasized budgetary issues, which are ways of identifying resources that are to go to cross-cutting cross policies that have to do with our peace accords and we also have resources destined to equity for women and the development plan also mentioned that these cross-cutting topics are very important and involve resources from several sectors, especially social sectors like health, education and others. Thanks to the GIFT Network Guide last year, we were able to do a data quest last year that had to do with women's groups. And allowed us to work on this very important issue. and we were able to work with civil society organizations. As the development plan says, this special follow-up mechanism was included for these important topics. And we want to tell you that a month ago, I'm sorry, the quality of sound is once again rough. So there's some appendices to the bill have to do with these issues, equity for women and the peace accords. And of course that is very related to our sustainable development goals as well. This information can be found by citizens in the formats that you see in the slide as documents, but they will also be in the open data formats in a few days for uh, so that any citizen who needs that information for analysis purposes can have it. We also want to tell you that another issue for this special tracking that we do for gender equity and for the peace accords and also right now, because of the COVID emergency, we're also following very closely the emergency situation. And we've included that with the help of the GIFT network in our 
a set of commitments that we will set before the OGP as a commitment not just of the administration but of the state to bring together all of the OGP issues that have to do with transparency and public participation. So we have partners from civil society groups that are going to use these budget tracking instruments to be able to follow up on these issues. So that's good news for us because not only is that an OGP commitment for the next few years, but even before the OGP commitment is officially declared, we're making this information uh, available for informa gender information, peace accords, and resources for the pandemic. And that's all in our website of economic transparency. And you can see what the resources are that are being destined for responding to the pandemic. And you can see there's 29 billion pesos, which is about seven billion dollars. So it's 29 trillion. Colombia, seven billion US dollars destined to the pandemic. And you can see what kinds of financial resources are going to which sectors. And you can also get some detailed information on the contracts so that you can see what resources are going where. So that's basically what we wanted to tell you. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you so much, Leo, such a pleasure. We'll see you throughout the week in other sessions. Uh, Romel Funde, El Salvador, I know you're in a hurry. Take your two minutes, please tell us about uh, your work. Adelante, Romel. Gracias. Juan Pablo. Thank you, Juan Pablo. It's a pleasure to be here sharing with our gift friends. Briefly, as you've asked, can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, so I can't hear you, but I'm going to go ahead and talk. Yes, go ahead. So we had a meeting in early 2019. Mr. Sosa was there, who's participating in the meeting today. And the idea was to improve the open budget index score. Our most important result, I think, is going to increase our index, even though it will, and we do have a budgetary cap information that are available to the public now. This is some information that we've had for years, but it's now being made public. And we hope that it will be done in 2020 as well. This has to do with the budgetary caps for the 2021 budget. And I think that's been a small but important uh, improvement that has helped our score. We have also worked on creating incentives for citizen participation. It's not always been successful but we have asked for access to public information lawsuits on cash flow data from the Ministry of the Treasury. And we've had some difficulties, but in the end, uh, they have been willing and they have found the information that we've requested. 
there is also a record of expenditures from previous budgets in a detailed form, and those are being discussed in the Office of uh, Access to Public Information in El Salvador. And we're also currently advocating so that we can make public the information, uh, information from the State Intelligence Office as regards to their budget. Uh, what happens in many Latin American countries is that these resources have been sources for um, the president's office to be able to use at their discretion and therefore has all, have also not always been linked to corruption. We're also working on the consolidation of a fiscal monitoring and advocacy center. And what we've done here simply is that we usually ask the Ministry of Finance for the database format, format and we create a budget database base year after year, and we make that available to the citizens in general. Also recently, and you know about this, Juan Pablo, and Vivek as well, is that we've had working meetings with IBP, the European Union, our colleagues from ISEFI, Ricardo, I understand, is participating in this meeting. And we're working together to talk with the Ministry of Finance and to present it with the results of the most recent open uh, budget survey from 2019. So we have a more technical document uh, worked up for the fiscal and economic policy department so that they can see those results as well. And finally, recently our legislature in El Salvador, which is, uh, has put together a group of civil society members to follow up on expenditures and making them more transparent uh, especially expenditures that have to do with the COVID pandemic. And I have to say that ISEFI is also working on that. So there's two organizations who, who two gift organizations, ISEFI and El Salvador working on this issue. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Ricardo. We'll, we'll get to you in a second. Let me now ask Chuck Farmar. He is representing our very de dear friend, Joel uh, Freeman. Uh, uh, Chuck uh, is at the Center on, on Budget and Policy Priorities, a US-based civil society organization with very good experience on making the government accountable. Chuck, welcome. Uh, thank you, Juan Pablo. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> good afternoon, good evening. Um, I will try to be brief. Um, I want to talk a bit about our work and engagement on the COVID response in the United States uh, and just on one particular policy area, hopefully of some, of some quick interest, uh, and I will be brief. Uh, and that is when the, when the crisis hit of the, the goal of getting money out as soon as possible to people, particularly low income people uh, in the United States. Um, just to back up quickly, the, the obviously the, the response of the United States to the pandemic has been a real tragic failure, right? We've had a very high death rate uh, in the United States, very high infection rate, and it's been really a uh, terrible policy, health policy response from the administration. Uh, as Carl, Carmela mentioned in Brazil, where you have uh, disproportionate black people being hurt there, same, same in the United States, right? The United States, Black Americans are being hit have, are very, very disproportionately hard. Latino Americans, Asian Americans, uh, it has been very, very a sad, very sad time. Um, on the economic front, the response has been somewhat, has been somewhat better, um, really because it's been driven by the Congress. There has been a very active response initially, and who I'm going to talk about, uh, but that response now is, is expiring, and there's a stalemate, which is uh, very troubling because hardship has started to really increase again. Um, 
But on the initial response, the reason it was effective at first was because the government provided very, very uh, generous unemployment benefits and also did cash payments of substantial amounts to individual adults and to children. And we, we worked very hard on that. Uh, and our goal coming into it was to work with our civil society partners and our allies in the government and the Congress to make sure that low income people were included um, and that they would be eligible for the benefits. And that actually was a very easy victory uh, that took very little effort, uh, so very surprising uh, because conservatives were willing to do that. And for the first time in the United States in a recession, uh, these checks that we often use were going to, went to everybody. Everybody's eligible. You don't have to have any income. Whereas in the past, there was always an income threshold. Uh, and now some a very poor person is eligible. So we quickly turned from the problem of who would be eligible to making sure people get the money. And this is a very big challenge um, for us and for the government. Uh, we were very concerned because the, in, our, in the US, the tax system is the best way to reach the most amount of people. And so it was run through the tax code. The problem is that 30 million people are outside of the tax code. And they happen to be low income people, disproportionately black, disproportionately Latino, right? Older Americans, disabled Americans. So the people arguably who need the money the most are the ones at risk of not getting it. Uh, so we tried very hard to get the staffs who were writing the bill to make the government deliver these payments to this group automatically like everybody else, right? Because everybody else who filed a tax return we just get this money deposited in their bank accounts or check automatically, right? But these 30 million people would not, right? And you have a global pandemic, right? Picture some older person having to go and file a return somewhere, a form, right? Very confusing. Um, so we were not very successful in writing the law as far as mandating that, but we did get enough discretionary authority that we could work with the government once it was done. And so what we did was we put out analysis on who these 30 million people were, demographically, where they're located, and also laying out how many of them receive different benefits, right? Millions of them receive retirement benefits from the governor. You have very poor veterans who receive benefits. You have disabled people who receive benefits. So we put pressure with our working with congressional members of Congress, writing letters, putting out public pieces, working through the media to pressure the government to deliver these payments automatically. And at first the government resisted uh, and did not, was not gonna do it for retired people, but eventually they actually were open-minded and they came around. And so pretty quickly, within a few weeks, they decided to automatically deliver to uh, elderly people. And then next came disabled people. They said, okay, but they do disabled people. Finally, then they figured out how to do poor veterans. So that was a, a big victory um, and millions and millions of people would get their money. Uh, and that left one very vulnerable group, about 10 million people, 12 million people who in the United States don't receive federal benefits, but do receive benefits that are delivered through state and local governments for food and for health care. And we tried to get the, the federal government to hook up with the state governments and deliver through the states and were unsuccessful, right? That, that was a bridge too far, uh, both in the law and both the government was just not willing to do that. Uh, so what we're doing now is we're working with civil society groups throughout the country in a major outreach effort to get the word out uh, on this group and who demographically who they are in areas and pushing state and local governments to get in touch with people to try to push them to encourage them educate them to get their money right because you know if you're a very poor person twelve hundred dollars is a lot of money uh, so we're still working on that and we're still working on it coming into the next round hopefully there's going to be negotiation. Our big, biggest defeat in this, uh, on this policy was leaving out immigrants, a big group of immigrants, and we're fighting to get them into the, to the next. So just to close, I think, uh, you know, the government, you know, we learned sort of coming out of this that, that we uh, do not, you know, in the United States have the ability to get to every citizen, every person in the country, and that needs to be prepared before the next time. Uh, and I think we've seen the toll the budget cuts have had on our, on our tax system, on our internal revenue service that needs to be rebuilt. Uh, and also we need greater transparency and we need to know as the government is writing these checks, who's getting them and what areas are being left out, 
right? This is, this is information the government has they should be able to deliver. And that would tell government, uh, local governments who's, what areas that they need to do more education in. Uh, and then, uh, so that I think is, is, is one more. And finally, the, the big part of our work is, is doing uh, tax credits for low income people. And uh, it does, we do have been somewhat successful there, but there are 27 million children in the United States who are left out of our main child allowance credit, right? And so in that sense, they, many of them, the poorest ones are outside of the tax system, right? So then not only do they lose that in good times, right? But here we have a crisis and they're outside the system for this emergency response. So it'd be much better to expand those tax sub subsidies, expand our, the reach of our tax code. And so people, when these crises hits, when these things are developed, that they're first in line also to get uh, payments. So I will stop there. It's just a brief overview of just one policy we've been working on. Thank you. Thank you. Brief, but very powerful, very inspiring, exemplary. It's great to have you as part of the network. You're talking about the United States with so many challenges in all fronts, including, as you mentioned, transparency and inclusion. Um, so again, uh, great to have you. Thank you for staying longer and to sharing this experience. We'll continue uh, talking about this. We will have a session on Thursday on, on tax reform. Uh, and I am sure that people will reach out to you and the center uh, to learn more in detail from your experience. Let me now go. I, I see colleagues uh, um, on the meeting. I mentioned Suki, Ricardo Barrientos. I see our difference from Montevideo, the uh, Office for Budget and Planning, uh, Janet, uh, Gabby. Uh, I see uh, uh, now uh, uh, my friend Merino, Gustavo from Argentina. If, if you guys have time, we have time and, and we'll get to your three minutes. Let me now ask uh, uh, Daniel Cerebro, from Cabri to take the floor. Three minutes, if you, if you please, and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Antonio. So um, yes, the Collaborative Africa Budget Reform Initiative is an intergovernmental organization. We provide a platform for peer learning and exchange for African ministries of finance, budget, and planning. And we've been asked to briefly provide an update of some of the work in fiscal transparency that we've been doing over the past year or so and our plan of action and goals going forward. So one of the things we've done is to work with the Ministry of Finance in Rwanda through our Building Public Finance Capabilities Program, which is an eight month action learning program and a team of local officials nominate a problem. And in this case, it was low citizen participation in planning and budgeting, which leads to limited accountability for results. So essentially this team of six officials together with a coach from the Cabri Secretariat embarked on an eight month problem driven iterative adaptation learning program to better understand why the problem matters and therefore got buy in for the problem by showing the link between transparency and accountability and participation and improved efficiency and policy outcomes. And some of the progress that the team made was to integrate feedback from consultations and develop a more simplified user-friendly tool for citizen engagement. They developed district-specific citizen guidelines. Um, they undertook citizen consultations in various districts. And they also engaged with students and disseminated citizen guides to secondary schools. Some other work we've done, we've, um, we've worked with parliamentary budget officers in a training workshop, where we provided hands-on training on the analytical capabilities and structure of a functional parliamentary budget office. So this essentially was working towards allowing legislatures to be better involved in the budget process, make better informed decisions on expenditure and debt, and improve their budget oversight role. And we're working on now information systems in PFM, and I won't go into that too much because we have a dedicated session on that on Friday, but essentially it's looking at some of the capabilities that countries require to use the information systems some of the challenges and lessons learned, and also um, the extent to which information systems have supported efficiency, effectiveness, and equity in government's COVID-19 responses. Another thing that we're working on is the COVID-19 monitor, 
So that's essentially a repository of public finance responses across the continent. And that's in recognition of the importance of PFM systems in responding to these types of extraordinary budgetary pressures and um, the importance of information sharing at this time. So it, one of the dedicated sections there is a transparency and accountability section where we look at how governments have been responding, either in line with their development partners requests or independently. I'll put a link in the chat box. And um, going forward in our next strategic plan, which will begin in April 2021, we really want our focus to be on improving the utility of information, very much in line with what GIF does, but working uh, with the goal of transforming our current work to be more about functionality than compliance and making more explicit the link between transparency and efficiency and effectiveness. And this will be achieved by focusing more on PFM data and tech, like many of you, strengthening the, continuing to strengthen the technical capabilities of oversight bodies, um, looking beyond central government to local government and ensuring information flows between central and subnational, also looking more into transparency, accountability, and cost efficiency in public procurement. And we'll continue our work on use of country systems and grant management, and also illicit financial flows. I hope I took around three minutes. Sean. You did, even a little bit less. Thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you Thanks. for staying late and, and sharing uh, your ongoing work and your plans with us. Um, Buenos Aires, Julieta Iscurdia. Your turn. Muchas gracias, Juan Pablo. Thank you, Juan Pablo. Go ahead, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Greetings to all of you. My name is Julieta and I'm part of Civil Society for Equality and Justice. I'm part of the program on fiscal justice. And for the new members, I would briefly share that we are an, a social a civil society organization that works on promoting social rights for the most vulnerable groups, as well as strengthening of democratic institutions. We promote political and social equality through three core programs, fiscal justice, democratic strengthening and open justice, the rights for people for disabilities, children's rights, and citizens' rights. During our three-year program on justice fiscal uh, on fiscal justice we focused on three goals the first one is to create a coalition of organizations from the from academia as well as political and social organizations to work that should work on a, on an agreement to establish fiscal policy for equality in argentina with regard to this goal we analyzed public investment in the pandemic we also provided recommendations for a fiscal policy that will respect social rights during the crisis. We focus on rights, like I said, and we are working on different proposals for a more progressive tax system. We also, we're also part of a regional initiative that focuses on guidelines uh, about human rights. We're trying to translate general guidelines on human rights into fiscal justice within the framework of this initiative we are also implementing distributive fiscal measures uh, which will be one of the issues to be discussed this week one of our goals is to democratize the public discussion in order to use budget analysis to promote rights we also developed a, an online platform. We called it Budget Monitor. We're trying to engage civil society and activists in order to monitor the budget based on public information that is um, updated so that they can do interesting comparisons at a national level. We also published budget analysis manuals um, we focused on gender and gender violence and we also developed different trainings for activists and public officers 
Every year we have a week that focuses on budget and rights together with other organizations as well as government officials. And we basically try to have an impact on the budget discussions. We talk about the execution of the budget and we will try also to promote accountability. We are working together with the National Auditing Authority. There is a very specific project on this issue. It's a more comprehensive agenda in this regard. We are working with the National Budget Office as well as different institutions to get involved in the budget cycle this year. We are promoting an open budget commitment to promote information about final beneficiaries of um, public funds. We also um, shared recommendations to improve public contracts, contracts. And another goal is to put an end to the fiscal secret in order to bring visibility to unfair fiscal privileges. We have three cases that are open where we are discussing the application of the fiscal secrecy with regard to some fiscal uh, expenditures, certain amounts that the state is not collecting. In this regard, we also promote transparency and accountability of fiscal expenditure at a local and regional level. Thank you very much. And we will continue to participate in the different sessions this week. of finance of guatemala president will come to you now gustavo we're down to two minutes <laughs> perdón ok ok eh, bueno buenas tardes a todos Good eh, afternoon. mi idea era un poquito mostrarles lo que habíamos lo que habíamos avanzado en, en estos años de que estuvimos participando con gif Throughout the eh, years poco, no that we've si participated in this initiative si se ve. i would like Eso, to share si no, my screen Can you see my screen? No. No, no señor. Bueno, no importa. ¿Eh? Not yet. No. Not yet. <laughs> a ver, a ver, así. Técnicamente se tendría que ver. Pero bueno. Bueno, si no, no importa. Eh, un poco lo que les quería comentar. Básicamente, era, ¿cuáles habían sido los avances que nosotros tuvimos? I wanted to share the progress that we've had en, esto, en este último año. Eh, we básicamente, nosotros tenemos una web que se llama Presupuesto Abierto, we donde publicamos toda la ejecución presupuestaria de la Administración Pública Nacional en Argentina en, Argentina. en eh, formato totalmente desagregado y con actualización diaria. The information is updated daily and is disaggregated. We have also developed different tools thanks to the work that we've carried out with civil society organizations. Like I said, we developed different tools in order to monitor public policies that are reflected in the budget. We also implemented a great deal of data sets. We have 450 data sets. And we also implemented a mechanism so that whoever is interested in anything that has to do with the budget can sign in and they will receive an email when the budget changes. Thanks to the work that we're carrying out with GIFT, we've improved the score of the Open Budget Index. And like Julieta said, we are working in the Open Government Initiative in order to publish information about public expenditure. That's what I had to share with you. And hopefully we will be able to address other issues during the week. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. So thank you. Uh, let me ask if Suki is still with us. I know Suki, we will hear from you on public participation. 
let me tell you while Suki probably gets reincorporated to the meeting that today is a holiday in Montevideo. And uh, uh, there you are, Kuk uh, Suki, uh, and you're <laughs> cute. Uh, good to see you. Uh, so it's a holiday in Montevideo, and in spite of the holiday, our dear friends uh, from uh, uh, the Office of the Budget and Planning are, are with us. So we'll come to them. I see Dr. Ran too. Good to see you, Dr. Ran. Suki, in a couple of minutes, if you please. Okay. Thanks, Juan Pablo, and, and thank you, everyone. It's been such a great meeting. I think I'll, I'll really, I won't even um, share anything on the screen, just to keep it short. And I'll also keep it short and try to speak slowly, which is going to be quite difficult for me, but I'll do it. Um, I'll manage it. Um, I think I'll just touch on uh, one or two things in relation to fiscal transparency work and one or two things um, in relation to public participation. So I'll really look at four things and hopefully that'll be within two minutes, four minutes, less than that. Um, in terms of our fiscal transparency work, we are in quite an exciting space in the sense that with a lot of input and support from the GIFT team, I think they're probably um, hopefully not getting tired of, of little questions and big questions and um, drama from South Africa. Um, but I think at this point, our open budget portal is um, in, in, a, in a very important um, uh, in some ways, um, path be between, uh, well, several different um, uh, pathways. Um, and I think we are in a phase where we've um, really developed a lot of interesting work. And, and at this point, looking to really deepen the, the um, public participation aspect of the budget portal. Um, we've had many exciting features, which we'll share um, hopefully later in the week um, on when, when our um, partners from the National Treasury join. Um, we've also um, been able to, in terms of our work within the, you know, specifically re in, relate in relation to COVID-19, um, worked quite hard to build um, civic dialogue and um, strengthen um, civic submissions, for example, to Parliament around transparency and demands for transparency with budget data and procurement data and a range of different asks. So we've also been quite, um, I think, uh, quite quite hard on our partners within the National Treasury and the Office of the Chief Procurement Officer to some extent um, in that regard. We're also quite excited to be working on um, within the context of a fiscal transparency open working group um, in the process of resuscitating our open government partnership agenda in the country. And so quite concertedly driving um, a fiscal transparency and open contracting agenda um, and developing a new national action plan. It's coming along slowly, but it's been quite exciting to get lots of input um, from a range of, of resources that um, the network and partners have, have, have shared with us. Maybe just a, a last point is that um, in relation to both public participation and fiscal transparency, we've been quite busy writing to essentially um, everyone from the nine provincial legislatures to the National Assembly, to the National Treasury and the Presidency, um, asking very core questions about opportunities to deepen uh, transparency, but also to opportunistically use our existing platforms, um, including Vulega Mali. So we've been writing lots of letters and I think everyone's quite tired of seeing um, us um, in, in letters and in, in, in the media around op-eds, um, around these key topics that we feel quite strongly on. Um, and happy to share later in the week just in more detail around that, but I think it's wise to stop there now. Thank you, Suki. Always learning from uh, uh, your advocacy, your effort and, and these stance you, you have of not letting go and of uh, resilience. Uh, congratulations. Uh, Montevideo in a holiday, uh, Oficina de Presupuesto y Planeación. Is uh, anyone there? Who's presenting? Paula? Janet? Hola. Paula. ¿Se escucha? Right. Yeah. Sí. Can you hear me? Yes. Bueno, buenas tardes este, para nosotros. Buenas noches para el resto. 
Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. I hope you can hear me. Greetings to Juan Pablo and the GIFT team. Thank you for giving us some minutes to share some information with all of you. I know we will have other opportunities throughout the week to share more information. Tomorrow is actually our officially our holiday. It's our Independence Day, but many people in Montevideo have, have taken today also off. The 1st of March 2020, we had a change of government. Luckily, the agenda stays in terms of strengthening fiscal transparency. That shows that we now have a government policy in this regard, not only when we launched it, but we, it continues. We are reviewing our work plan right now. On the 13th of March, we had the first COVID case. So we, on the 31st of August, we'll have to pr submit the national budget. It will be submitted, the national budget, on the 31st of August. So as you can imagine, the situation has been very complicated. The government implemented measures right away. Health measures, and little by little, we are restarting economic activities and other measures were also taken measures that had to do with fiscal issues next week for example in terms of the budget you could have all the information available on our fiscal transparency portal paula will show this during the next session we continue to work on open data and open budgets we continue to work on gender issues public procurement We found all today's presentation is very fruitful and very interesting. That's why I would like to thank all the previous speakers. Given the time, I'm sure many people are looking forward to having lunch, others to going to bed. So I will wrap it up right now. I try to be as brief as possible. It is really a pleasure to see you. Um, after 12, our time is to that uh, we have issues, but uh, we still have people, so don't worry. Uh, again, I'll just ask you to be very, very brief. Let's go to Guatemala City, uh, Ministerio de Finanzas and Ricardo Barrientos. Who's presenting from the Ministry of Finance? Can you please uh, take the floor? Hola, buenos días. Introduce yourself. No, si, escuchan. Ah, bueno. Can you hear me? Adelante. Of course. Jose Antonio, adelante, adelante. Jose Antonio, the floor is yours. Tenemos una mala conexión, Jose Antonio. Jose Antonio's connection is not very good and is breaking off. He froze. We cannot hear you, Jose Antonio. El pasado continuó con la red, porque la otra semana vamos a presentar hoy con la participación de la sociedad civil. Obviamente, tal vez logra andar en el año pasado. The interpreter would like to apologize because the connection is so bad that the speaker cannot be interpreted. En la edificación del índice presupuesto abierto, por tercera evaluación consecutiva, Guatemala incrementó su edificación. Esa obra, pues, como 65 focos y producto del eso que se ha hecho adicionalmente lanzamos un portal de seguimiento de los programas José sociales, Antonio me oyes eh, a través de los cuales se está, se está atendiendo la emergencia del COVID-19 así mismo lanzamos un tablero de different decrees by Congress Bien. Es el, el cuarto plan de gobierno abierto que incluye ahorita en agosto de este año y tenemos expectativas para el quinto. Perdón. Como ciudad pues, civil. 
no podemos escucharte. Vamos a esperar eh, en reunión posterior que tengas una mejor conexión. Disculpa, Ricardo. Hello, everybody. Uh, Ricardo, the floor is yours. We can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, muchos saludos. Gran abrazo, Juan Pablo. Greetings, Juan Pablo. Big hug. Very, very briefly, because we are running out of time, and uh, I do have a, a meeting in a few minutes. Uh, so the um, what what I uh, want to to say is that Isefi. Uh, has been working in the region, not only in Guatemala. Uh, my very good friend, uh, uh, Romel Rodriguez, already mentioned uh, our work in El Salvador. So, uh, in our work in Guatemala, uh, it's grouped in more or less three areas. First is oversight of the, govern of the government programs to, to face uh, the pandemic. Uh, and uh, what we are we have done uh, in that area is try to uh, find the data and explain in very simple and plain language for the non-specialized public. And that was very, very difficult because the, 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 the data, the information was there, but it uh, wasn't easy to, to get. The second area is to engage with the government, with the Ministry of Public Finance, uh, in order to try to find ways uh, to publish uh, the data in, in a more uh, uh, accessible, more easy reading uh, format. And uh, it is what uh, my friend Jose Antonio from the ministry was uh, mentioning. Uh, the, the government um, made a special website with the, all the data following some of, uh, of ISEFI recommendations. And uh, the third one is to uh, put together a civil society a alliance with more or less 10 organizations uh, specifically uh, dedicated to oversight and follow uh, and make some follow up or the government programs and actions to, to face the pandemics. So on those three areas, close linked with fiscal transparency, uh, we are trying to, 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 to make our contribution to the effort. So, in, 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 in brief, uh, making data accessible, engaging with the government, and uh, putting together a, a civil society. So, Magnifico. Uh, we, we will uh, make more detail in the following meetings. Gran yes. abrazo. Thank you, you too. Colleagues, I believe that we're almost there. Dr. Ran, would you like to close the meeting? saying hello, and anyone that, who would like to take the floor very briefly for one or two minutes, we need to close at 12, because after 12, the spell disappears and, and I become something uh, different. Dr. Ran, are you there? From Nigeria, our champion in the Ministry of Finance in, in Nigeria. Well, if, if you cannot join us now, uh, I know that you will be joining uh, later in the week. There you I'm are. I'm here. I'm here. Great I just muted you. myself. <laughs> uh, hello. How are you? I'm fine. How's Zuki? How's everybody? <laughs> Everybody's fine. In a couple of, I muted, a couple my, of minutes, I muted myself so that um, the noise in the background will not disturb. Good. Yeah. So we'll speak later, Dr. Rand, okay. in the meeting on public participation. Yes. And, and OGP meeting. Good to see yes. you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Okay. Okay. And with that, dear colleagues, I believe that uh, we can close. One hour late, sorry. But uh, <laughs> we really wanted to make sure that uh, uh, we could see you. We will soon be able to not only see you, but hug you and be with you and accompany you in your efforts to move this agenda forward. Be patient. Thank you again. And we'll see you in one hour for the next meeting. If it's late, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.
Have a great day.